Welcome to Combat Theory Presents, a bi-weekly podcast about all things martial arts, fight science, and combat sports. Your host is Paul, the evil professor, Antonelli, and our newest episode starts right now. All right, guys, we are joined today by someone that requires no introduction, but I'm going to give her one anyway because she deserves it. We are joined by Felicia Spencer. Felicia is a... BJJ Black Belt, a former Invicta FC featherweight champion, a UFC veteran who has literally fought a who's who's list of women uh, in MMA currently, including a first round submission of Megan Anderson and uh, went to decision against both Chris Cyborg and Amanda Nunes. And even though Felicia retired in 2021, uh, she is still listed by many as a top 20 featherweight contender. So, Felicia, I think many people know how your career went, but if you could give me an idea of how you got involved in martial arts to start off with, I think that would be amazing. Thank you for the introduction. Of course. Um, So, as many uh, martial artists, I started when I was a kid. My parents decided to put me in martial arts because they saw, pretty sure they saw Hoist Gracie do do his thing in the UFC. Not that they were UFC fans, but they recognized it and thought martial arts in general was awesome so they put all three of us kids in and what did you start off with i started with taekwondo okay when i was four were you now you you were born in canada i was that's like the the, the that's the, the thing that really ran with yeah ran with it hard in the ufc <laughs> okay yeah, you are wearing i see that you're <laughs> right. wearing it your says right. usa here oh no oh. well i alternated oh. like the gear and the flag with a lot of fights because they didn't used to let you like mix your flag oh yeah no, so they it's, like, do, you right? pick one and so i would do like okay my outfit is american and my flag is canadian then i would switch okay so. <laughs> all right all right you gotta represent yeah. both yeah. i get that i'm a dual citizen right you um you were born in canada but you moved to the united states pretty pretty early in your life yeah i was I was pretty much four. Yeah. Four, okay. So, so when you started uh, martial arts, that was in the United States? Yes, yep, in Georgia. In Georgia, okay, yep. and that was Taekwondo? It was Taekwondo, yep. We lived at the military base in, uh, holy crap, I'm forgetting the name, but yeah, military base in Georgia. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, near irrelevant. Hinesville, yeah. Yeah, right. it doesn't Fort, matter. Fort Stewart, story. sorry, Fort Stewart. Fort Stewart in yeah, Georgia, we started, okay. started uh, Taekwondo there. Yeah, yeah. and uh, did you, what? did you like it? Did you hate it? Were you forced to do it? What was your thoughts? Oh, no, I loved it. I mean, I had two older brothers, so like, you know, it was just, it was a vibe for, for the whole family. So. Did, did you compete in Taekwondo? No. No, really? No, never competed in Taekwondo, um, aside from like inner school. Yeah. Like when I got to Florida, like the gym I was at. Had a lot of like inner school tournaments, but never once actually did I compete outside of my own gym. Really, it's expensive. Yeah, yeah. that's so yeah. that was kind of a thing for that's my family. So interesting. <laughs> so, I imagine if you competed, your brothers would probably want to compete. So now your parents right, got to put I up mean, for like four admissions. Yeah, yeah of course. It's, it would be. How many brothers do you have? Two. Two well, brothers. Yeah. Okay, and they're both older than you. Yeah. yeah. So, um, at some point, you transitioned into MMA. A uh, training is that correct? Or? Yeah. So when I was twelve, my the Taekwondo gym had BJJ adult BJJ. And okay. Like they would start to do like a okay every Friday our classes are BJJ. So all right. we were all kind of like learning that um, like once a week starting when I was twelve. Obviously loved it. I mean who doesn't when it's fun to choke each other. <laughs> um, and then pretty much just stuck with exclusively Taekwondo and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu until I was like eighteen. At 18. that point, I was a blue belt. You know, I've been training, and then I would go to the adult classes as soon as I, like, was big enough to, like, prove myself. <laughs> okay. Uh, my mom actually did it with me, too, she, and my grandpa actually joined also. No kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he I was, like, 72. Awesome. Um, he started jujitsu jitsu and, and he did it for a couple months, but then he broke his rib, and it was like, ah, oh, I might be a little too old for this. <laughs> so uh, I was like, who, what? <laughs> who broke his rib? Um, the same thing. My mom also, like, she was really good at uh, key locks. Uh, she was <laughs> pretty awesome. She tapped me out a lot when I was, like, 13, you know? Really? Um, but, yeah, so she did it as well. Does she still bring this up on a regular basis? This is something my mother would talk about. Well, she, oh, my mom. She, right. Yeah, 100%. She talks about the key locks a lot. Um she did taekwondo too so like she will bring up well actually my dad will bring up the time that my mom tried to show uh my dad how much she's been practicing so she like did like a back kick on him pretending but she accidentally kicked him in the nuts (laughs) instead of in the gut like she was going to show him a back kick to the gut but it was like has there ever been (laughs) has there ever been like a family gathering where you guys like 
try to spar one another? Never. No. no. Oh, I'd love to see that. No. You, this is, we can make this happen. We can do like a combat theory presents like right. Felicia Spencer <laughs> sparring the family. Yeah. Right. The Spencer sparring bar. Do your are your older brothers still involved in martial arts at all? No, no. no. So like my oldest brother, he he pretty much after we moved back to Florida, he he wasn't really into it. It wasn't his thing. Um, my older, my middle brother, the one I was actually pretty close to growing up, very close to growing up, he did it until he was about 15 and his passion was always cooking. Okay. So he got a job in the kitchen and kind of pulled away from it right there. Yeah. But then it was for me, it was like, kind of like, I'm passionate about this. I'm just going to keep doing this. And I started teaching kids classes, helping yeah. and stuff like that. So I just ran in that direction and they kind of found their own. Now you went to college at the University of Central Florida, correct? Yep. And then how did you end up being at the jungle? So I went to UCF. Well, coming back up a little bit because in Englewood, small town. So Mike Lee, who is my still today, my head coach at the jungle, he owned a part owner of the jungle. He lived in Englewood. He actually graduated from the same high school as me, obviously way before me. Wow. (laughs) Sorry. Way. Sorry. Way way before before. me. No, no, but he ran the, um, like the adult MMA class that was at that Taekwondo school. I was talking about at super kids at night, they would have all the MMA guys come in and I never participated in that. I was like, hell no, I'm not doing MMA and not boxing. I'm not getting hit in the face at all. Jujitsu, Taekwondo. That's it. Um, so he knew me from there. He had been there for, you know, I, he knew me since I was like 12, 13 years old. Sure. And, um, but I never really was like close to him. He never was like my instructor because even the jujitsu class was run by someone else and he would come in after I was done training. So, but he knew, you know, that I went to Orlando and he pretty much right when I got to UCF, he was like, hey, they had opened up the jungle like six months prior. It was right after Kim, uh, Seth knocked out Kimbo they op- right around that time. Um, and he texted me like, you know, you're welcome to come in. We'd love to have you pretty much just invited me with open arms and was super accommodating to me. And like, just made me feel like I had a family in Orlando. And that was really how I ended up at the jungle, even though it was like, you know, a bit of a drive from, from UCF. Yeah. Um, but it was like literally like a family that I had there that built in. He kind of like invited me to join it. And it was just like immediately they welcomed me and they loved, it was almost like I was like their mascot because it was like, 2009 there wasn't there was like one other girl at the gym you know so it was like they're trying to bring in girls and they just loved how yeah it was awesome so Um, that brings us to an interesting thought when you started in mma there weren't a lot of women training there wasn't really like a career path for competitive fighting as a as a female so at, at what point in your mind did you start to think like maybe there was something did you compete in jiu jitsu first I did. I, when I was um, 17, I did my first jiu-jitsu tournament, like a Naga. And then I, I was pretty regular at competing um, when I got to the jungle. I would go to the, all the tournaments and stuff like that. Um, and, yeah, there wasn't really, like, a end game. It was mm-hmm. just, like, compete to test yourself, and that was pretty much it. And then um, at that time, there was no, like, amateur MMA. It was just you fight, and that's you're a professional fighter when you fight. Um, so they had me actually lined up for a fight back in – Right, right when I got there, so like 2010, mm-hmm. they had me because I they I started doing MMA classes and Muay Thai and all this, and it was like this is really fun. I'm really good at it, and well, you know, for where I was at in my my uh, training, and they were like, you should totally do a fight. You would do great. Like, who has that many years of experience? Who's jumping into this right now? Um, and it was true. So they lined me up with a fight. It fell through, and then next thing you know, there's like a law with amateur fighting, and then then it got really hard to get fights because. You know, just I had, you know, 12 years of experience in Nobody martial arts. Fight and you, yeah. No one wants to fight that much experience right off the bat. I was already a purple belt in jujitsu. All the other women that were probably competing at the time have been training for six right, months or yeah, something. Yeah, so it was like I had an opportunity to fight pro. It fell through, and then it just was like, and then it got really hard after that. And now at some point you ended up being in the inaugural Tough Enough. And uh, what when was your first, like, real fight? Uh, well, I fought a few times in Florida. Okay. Amateur. I fought three times in Florida. Was, let's, let's talk about um, your first amateur fight because that, that's kind of a big deal. It was like one of the it, – probably the first five of women's amateur fights in the yeah. state of Florida. Because Jamie Wo- Moyle was number one. R- okay, yeah. The very yeah. First Jamie and she, she trained fight. with us yeah. with me uh, at the jungle. Um, yeah, so I fought – um, Jamie was on that car- mm-hmm. card, I think. Yeah, Jamie was on that card. It was in Hollywood at the Hard Rock – for fighter source and 
I was, I mean, everyone at the gym, like I was, I'm, you know, I was a purple belt. I was feeling pretty good about myself. Obviously I've been training a long time, got a fight and really was just like, it didn't go, it, di- it wasn't exciting. I'm pretty sure. I don't remember even ever seeing it like an, uh, looking back on a video of it, but I know it was kind of a boring fight. Yeah. <laughs> I think I was just like afraid to like gas out because that was like the horror story is just like gassing out in the first round. So I remember that feeling and then it was just like, man, this was a shitty fight and then <laughs> split decision. I lost. So I lost my first fight. Everyone was like so hyped up about yeah. me, you know, like, um, you know how gyms can be so supportive of you mm-hmm. and it's just like, you're going to kill it. And then it's like, you really sucked <laughs> for a night. <laughs> you let so us all it was down. Like, yeah. wow. And wow. then, and then like, and it was an opportunity, um, that night. So it was just, I don't even, I don't know if they lasted after this year that they did this, but they had fighter source where they were doing like tryouts like so i was trying out for the american team to go overseas and fight the sweden team so everyone who won that night got to go to sweden to fight and like every other person on my team won so i had five of my jungle guys go to sweden and then it was just like me hanging out behind do you remember who you fought (laughs) um oh my god so it was jennifer nixon who if you look at topology didn't have a career that really panned out probably the way that she expected um so she just a few years ago she was still like fighting amateur had a pretty split record really but her first fight she beat me she beat <laughs> fair and square she beat me title contender <laughs> yeah uh, i was actually at an event where she was fighting i think in the co-main event or something like that uh years later for an amateur fight and it was just like crazy to see like the difference just crazy in time. yeah like a, nothing against her obviously but like it was just wild to think about like i lost and like it's so humbling you know it's like anyone can lose to anyone on any any day it's just like you have to be ready in the moment so yeah that's a great lesson it is yeah i love that i lost my first fight it was such and it's so like when when i know people at the gym who fight especially their first fight and they lose it's like hey i also lost my first fight and then I didn't lose again for like five years. You know what I mean? Fair. It like, so it's, you know. How many how good. many times did you fight amateur? Six times. Yeah. All right. So three times in Florida. Then I went to, Ve- uh, not Vegas, New Orleans. Grindle was there. Grindle uh, coached me in that one. I fought Macy Chasson. She's in the UFC. Sure, sure. Um, so I fought there. And then after that, that's when I went to Vegas twice for the Tough Enough yeah. um, event. And then that was a tournament where I won my Invicta contract. All right, so, so that's, that's when you made your debut that as was a pro. When, exactly. So I won Tough Enough tournament, so I fought there twice, and then I made my Invicta debut. So you um, debuted in Invicta in September 12th, 2015 in Kansas City, Missouri. Is that correct? That sounds right, yeah. 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 <laughs> Lightweight, right? Yes, yep. What what weight class is that for our 55, listeners? 155. 155, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, what were your... What were the things about your debut? Do you remember that were like surprising or what were the things that were kind of like, did you feel like you were ready to go pro? I was super mm-hmm. excited. I knew, I knew I was ready. Like I was, yeah. I was ready like years before I was ready to just <laughs> like, <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, I only did six amateur fights because I knew it would get me in contract with well, Invicta. So. Talking about that New Orleans fight. The reason why we did that was because in Louisiana, you can just have one amateur fight and go pro, and then if they like what they see, the, the yeah. athletic commission will grant. And that was our plan, and but right after that fight is when Tough Enough reached out, right. and then it's like, well, we can get right into Invicta if you win two fights. Yeah, so that's and why. Yeah, and at the time, Invicta was pretty n- not new because I had been watching them for a couple of years, but it was like that's the pinnacle of women's MMA. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you could still make an argument that other than the UFC, Invicta is probably the pinnacle of women's. It, it's probably the strongest path if you're like at least in the U.S. Probably some other countries as well. To yeah. get to the U.S. And, and I mean, other than one championship, mm-hmm. you know, I, I I would say that they get a lot of coverage, especially when they were on Fight Pass. It was like yeah, you know, the UFC had eyes on it a lot. But now they don't have as many fights as they used to have. It's like less often. It feels like mm-hmm. ever since yeah. COVID, really. And they, I think so, they stream on YouTube now. So they yeah. had they've changed yeah. platforms. I don't, and it's like they switch platforms a lot. And still a great promotion. I hope that they're gonna stick around for a long time because yeah, oh, I, I, agree. I don't, I don't think I miss any of them. I still watch them to this day. They do That's, open scoring. I think is interesting. They're right? not, they're not afraid to do different things. Yeah, they had, right. they had uh, ring men. Right. Remember oh yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. Elias. Um, Elias yeah. yeah. May he rest in peace. That yeah. was 
absolutely that was yeah I'll, oh, yeah i love that they try new things like that and they tried lightweights you know yeah. that wasn't very common no. back you know back when i i mean you got you got the contract the tough enough fights were at lightweight as well right right so you're so, supposed to be a lightweight fighter that's what i remember thinking like felicia is going to be the best 155 pound girl in the world cause yeah. there's not a lot <laughs> right and i remember there was a one there was another lightweight fight in invicta and i think they were uh, kind of getting behind her name was like veronica Verschenhauser or something from she was from texas i think and she was a big lightweight. She was tall, like Megan Anderson saw, you know, like bigger, big, tall girl. And she had some kind of health problem that made her retire, oh, like wow. right after she was like two fights into her pro career. And yeah, Invicta was really hard behind her. And I think that was why they wanted like more lightweights to come in because they wanted to build like kind of a division around her. Around maybe. her, yeah. Um, so and then when she retired, like right around the time that I got into it, there was a few that I was like trying to call out. And then after my first fight, um, they had kind of said, well, actually, I think I had brought it up. I was like, hey, if you want me to fight at 45, I can make that happen. I feel like I'm in a place now, you know, uh, that I'm comfortable with saying I can commit to that. Because I was always like, that's a, it was a hard cut always, but and I got to a place where I was like, I can commit to that. I can make that happen. Do you feel comfortable letting us know what you walked around at when you were cutting to 155? Uh, like 170. One, okay, yeah. so you made a, you were making a big cut down to 145. Uh, well, when I was at 145, I would well, I would like out of camp, I I would get up to 170. But at, when I was 145 fighting, it was I was keeping it a little under 170. So okay. like 68, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but I would always be like, oh, I can't touch that 70 mark. You know? What but, kind of? Um, but it was always do... over 20. Yeah, I would start camp like right around 20. Yeah. Pounds. Did you do a pretty significant dehydration for those fights? Um. I mean, it's, it's, I guess, who significant kind of depends. <laughs> like, like, were you opinion. doing, like, a hot tub? Were you doing, I like would always do salt baths. Salt baths. Yeah, I always liked salt baths. Well, after I experienced saunas, I just decided I didn't like it. <laughs> yeah. uh, but salt baths work really well. I would, so fight, the beginning of fight week, I would usually be around 10 to 12 pounds out. Okay. So, if you think that's hard or, or not hard, whatever your opinion, yeah. I guess. It was, uh, sometimes it was tough. Other times it was just, like obviously sucks but clockwork like i knew what to expect and i just never had like any issue but yeah I, th I think that's one of the things about our industry that's very weird is that kind of every gym every camp has different thought processes on weight cutting and how significant a weight cut should be and even the method by which they weight cut right mm -hmm. i see a lot of people doing like the hot towel blanket thing now which sounds to me like you're a mummy on the floor <laughs> i wouldn't want to do that you know but that's her thing now i mean it's, it's very common so like now. you get out of the the tub and then you go under the blanket. Yeah, exactly. To like keep sweating for while you're yeah, resting. Yeah, that of. that looks terrifying to well, me. Your last because uh, so I know you mentioned a little bit before. I coach Felicia, uh, like most of your amateur, if not all of it. I don't think I actually worked with you for your first fight. I was like a teammate more. Right, more of a teammate. Yeah, yeah so yeah. it was pretty much all of the amateur and then the first two pro fights, and then I moved to Vegas, and then mm -hmm. you did most of your career. Then I moved back to Florida, and I got to work with her her last three fights in the UFC. So I remember doing weight cuts, you know, way back in the day, probably not the smartest ways. And then by the last couple of fights, I was like, oh, shit, she's got this down to a science. Like, she's like, been working with the I'm UFC PI. She's a real professional yeah. now. Like, I literally felt so useless at her last two weight cuts. I was just like, I got this job. grindle. Don't worry about I'm me. I'm glad I'm here. Yeah. You go back to your room. Yeah, I'm just, like, texting the whole time. Yeah. Like, she's doing great. Right. Yeah, yeah, this is awesome. Where, honestly, where's my fight gear at? I got to say, like, yeah. uh, for most of my fights, Todd, my if you don't know, my husband, Todd, he was great always with me, that. but also, like, I'm the type of person he knows that I'm just, like, if I want something, but I feel like it's inconvenient for someone, I'm not going to say it usually. <laughs> so he just kind of got into my head where he's like, he knows where I'm at and he would just say what I needed to happen yeah. without me needing to say it. You know what I mean? Like, so he was, even when I would be like, no, 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 don't ask them. Don't, like, don't, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Don't do that. He would just set it up for me. So like, it was kind of like a good collaboration, like him being able to be there and also like, having it be like a person i'm in a relationship with where it's like yeah. you know when you're cutting weight you're basically naked and it's not going to be awkward like if i was doing it with my coach you know what i mean so oh yeah i like, think that kind of uh worked out to my benefit as much as it's like you know you try to keep like the relationship separate from your professional duties it's like in that sense it was easy because i could just 
crawl out of the tub and be yeah. like, I'm good. I'm just going to wrap up in this blanket. And, you know, yeah. when you're cutting weight and you just kind of like don't give a fuck about anything, you don't want to worry about like modesty yeah, yeah of exactly course. No, I it's like that. i don't give a fuck like, you become yeah. like a uh, uh like a primal ape almost. right it's just yeah, like yeah. just get me out of here <laughs> why am i doing this right <laughs> so uh, yeah. all right rich what do you got for me brother well you know uh talking about that like me working with you personally but also i think pretty much all your fight fans know like you have this residual toughness throughout your whole career you're also one of the nicest people in the game but you're known for being so tough. So just, you know, how does that play out in like your normal life, your UFC career attributes into your like your, your daily life? Things that you've done in martial arts that kind of transcend into, you know, your regular day to day. Yeah. So I feel like I'm in my normal life. I'm kind of a pushover. <laughs> 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 no, I'm really not conf- confrontational, but um, I don't know. I feel like it's more always just been like, um, I don't want to ever give up on something that I am trying, you know? So I feel like in like those moments in the fight, it's like, I can't stop trying. It never really even occurs to me to just stop, I guess. (laughs) Or it's just like, uh, gotta just keep going until the job's done, whether you win or lose, you know? So, um, I guess it's not really like a conscious effort. Although I, I I am a believer that like you can build toughness. So in a sense, it probably is a little bit conscious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's kind of like a hard thing to, figure out because if you if you're not in a tough position it's really hard to see where you are in, on your toughness yeah. level you know so it's kind of hard to like practice that <laughs> uh, naturally there's actually i think there's two kind of schools of thought on on self-discipline and and researchers look at it in two different ways where some researchers believe that discipline toughness is a learned skill that is practiced and other um, researchers believe that you almost have an intrinsic natural ability to be more disciplined and it's it's pretty debated yeah as to what it is i feel like it would be a mix of those though uh, you yeah know? for sure be, right it's yeah it's like, like the nature versus nurture right and then a lot of times it always does seem like to be now, so but you grew up in a you were a, a brat you grew up in a military family uh yeah in a way so my dad was in the military until i was uh six or eight i think okay. I was eight and then he we moved to florida and then he got you know he got back into like other construction jobs and stuff okay. like that um, so it was a short, you know, a short period, but still, like, it was probably just a part of our yeah. upbringing. He wasn't, like, super strict. If anything, he was, like, the more laid-back parent, yeah. you know. I guess I should probably um, let listeners know that uh, military brat is a term for people that grew up in the military. I, I was about to say, right. Paul, what are you doing? We yeah, just yeah, worked yeah, so yeah. hard right. to get a guest. Yeah. And now you're <laughs> so, a brat. Brat. so brats no. are typically yeah. kids that are kind of shuttled from base to base and right. they kind of grow up in the military yeah. institution you have you heard that term before of course yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. i have yeah. see rich gave me a look like he was gonna no, stab me no. there. I, was, I was just gonna say no. man yeah so no. you um w- when you w- when you came to orlando your father had basically left the military oh yeah he was yeah. he was long out of it he actually worked on an oil rig for most of my life uh childhood i guess you know Jeez, that's like, probably um so he was tougher. doing so I think right. part of yeah. like yeah. <laughs> So I think part of like well his personality is just laid back anyway but like he would be gone for 2 weeks come back for 2 weeks so like when he was back it was like woo dad's home you know and then when he'd be gone it would be like you know just like I mean it was normal either way so that was just like what I was used to um but yeah I don't know where I was going with that um, <laughs> but, <yeah>. so <laughs> Uh, we were talking about discipline. Oh, yeah, yeah. D- do you feel like when you – do you feel like discipline or martial arts made you more disciplined in general? Um, I, th- You know, everyone in my family is pretty, like uh, – so there's – like, we have a strong work ethic. Okay. Um, And then I guess, like, discipline, if you think about, like, I don't know, like, if you are, you know, drinking or whatever, like, have, like certain other realms of discipline that you might consider, like, I don't know if the martial arts has any impact on that, but I don't know. It's hard to describe. I feel like martial arts has given me more like confidence in my ability to do something more than I don't think of it so much as discipline. Sure. But at the same time, I don't know a life without martial arts. So I don't really have like a comparison. Mm. You know what I mean? Like I never didn't have martial arts. So how am I really supposed to know what that feels like? No, of course. <laughs> so, so you worked your way up to being the uh, Invicta, um, featherweight champion and then you got into the ufc yep do you remember what that feeling was like um it was so i 
I, uh, I don't remember exactly the order of events, but it was like I was really ready to like just like jump in with both feet. And I remember talking to Shannon Knapp, the president of, of Invicta, and she kind of like gave me her blessing. She said that she would reach out to Mick Maynard, who is the matchmaker for my division, you know, in the UFC. And then when I got a call from Mick Maynard, it was like, I think Todd and I were driving and it was just like, oh, you know, I was like, oh, so it was just, it was definitely crazy. And I was like, man, I really just want to be able to give this opportunity my everything. And at the time I was working full time, well, working full time at Florida Virtual School, I was a full time teacher. So I was like, man, I would really like, I really wish I could just like stop that completely and just dive in. Um, but with, you know, with the starting out contract, it's like, it's not really something I was willing to do to like, yeah. it's like, it's, it's like, I didn't want to give up the money I was making teaching <laughs> to, to be a full-time fighter. Um, but so that took a few years for me to like get to a point where I did actually take a break from teaching yeah. to commit to really fighting full-time. I guess I'm just always like, I need that backup plan. And if I don't feel comfortable with like, I wasn't going to take like, I wasn't going to take a step backwards you know, in that sense of like getting paid, you know? Yeah. I, mean? I think that's so. the craziest thing about, about our sport, because you think when you think professional UFC fighter, and then at the same time you're hearing, um, on the show, you say, I mean, I was making more money as a teacher and I didn't want to lose that ability. Um, is, is crazy that you're, you're working and training as a professional athlete and easily the most d dangerous professional sport, right? I mean, it's up there, it's way up there. You know, maybe that and race car driving, you know, bull riding, if that's a real job. I don't know if it is or not. It's a, it's a so-called sport. So-called sport. Yeah. Is that is it more or less dangerous than rugby, Rich? Far less. Far less. Far less. Yeah. Really? It seems yeah. like it. Wow. You're crazy, Rich. <laughs> um, so who your first fight in the UFC was? Megan Anderson. Megan Anderson. Mm -hmm. And Megan was coming out of uh, Invicta looking very, uh, very dangerous. Well, she, she was, was she was the champ. Yeah, yeah she was, she was looking very very champ. dangerous. In a lot like, of people's eyes, you know, if you like were on forums and such like I was, uh, you know, this is the true featherweight title fight for Invicta. Because yeah, because Megan got the title, then went to the UFC. It's vacant. Your fight with Pam Sorensen, which is an awesome fight, one of the best female featherweight fights uh, that Invicta ever had, UFC ever had. Just great fight if you guys want to watch that. Well, thanks. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> For it was back and forth. Let's be honest. Pam, oh yeah, yeah. Pam landed some dope shit on oh, you. Oh my god, yeah. 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 I, I do, <laughs> you know, I do remember a moment in that fight. I think it was like round four, and I was like, "This, I don't feel like this is going my way." <laughs> and I was just like, "I was like, I feel like I, it was the first time where I felt like I was kind of like drooping and like." man and then all of a sudden i was like no and then i like came back to life and i like i think i had my back on the cage and i like turned her around and i was like no and i just like drove her to the cage and yeah i think that's pretty much like i think that's when i finished her i'm not sure yeah it was but it, it was, was like one of my favorite moment. fights of yours to watch it was a really good one right it's like um, you just like seeing me get hit <laughs> <laughs> she ate that elbow so good um <laughs> kept the chin down <laughs> like, after all i did to you right <laughs> um but yeah, so for a lot of the Invicta fans, that Megan Anderson fight, Felicia Spencer fight, that was the true. Who is the real who's, Invicta who, yeah. FC featherweight yeah, champion? So. Well, we we clearly know who that was. We do. Yeah, yeah. Um, because you submitted Megan Anderson in the first round with a rear naked choke. Do you remember that feeling? Um. Yeah, I remember. I had a really like. Um, I guess maybe you would call it like a primal reaction when I like stood up and I was just like everyone I just knew that everyone uh like even Mick Maynard, like he's Australian. I knew he was he wanted signed me, me so that Megan yeah. could beat me and I was just like, Yeah I was like, mm, and I had to don't don't look it up if you're watching. Please don't look up that clip of me going like, yeah. It so <laughs> it's, it's so funny because uh, for anyone who's trained with Felicia, we all know like she's a badass. She'll she'll beat up just about anyone. I was at the jungle for a long time, obviously, and uh, you know you were kind of like our, as the instructors, our, our go-to enforcer because you'd get these guys in the gym that you know they they all have ego and it's like go roll with Felicia, she would just crush everyone, but she's so nice about it. So when you see those moments in the the cage like that, and it wasn't every fight you're like that. You're always like sweet mm -hmm. and respectful to yeah. your opponents. There's there's been a few where <laughs> you kind of lost. It. I feel like that's the one where I was just. Like, but you do feel like they, the UFC wanted you to lose that fight. Well, I feel like they wanted to build the division and like they 
probably wanted Megan to be like the face of that division. You know what I mean? Like yeah. not necessarily that they have like a game plan because I don't think that they plan out. Oh, we're gonna sign this fight and she's gonna lose and then this is gonna happen. But it's like, who would have expected that? You know what I mean? Like aside from my team and me, looking at Megan, she's got a six inch height difference. She, you know, she looks like a fucking athlete. You she's know, a like, Viking. Yeah, yeah she's, she's like she's huge. Viking. Like she's yeah. just like yeah. Um, and she had already fought in the UFC, so she was she, was that right after she it toe was, kicked. It was Zingano? yeah, she beat so she beat Zangano. She toe ki- yeah, she kicked her in the eye, and that With fight ended. It was a weird one, and yeah. I feel like it was after. So it was definitely after she fought Holly Holm because I remember when I beat I think it was Helena like before my title fight even. I was like I was on the mic at Invicta, and I was like. And he, Megan was in the crowd, and I was like, oh, I'd love the opportunity to finish, but Holly couldn't because Holly didn't fish, finish Megan, but she mm. took her down constantly. And I was like, well, if Holly Holm can take you down, I can take you down. <laughs> <laughs> Which uh, is kind of yeah. true, right? Well, it was, <laughs> yeah, it played out, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, she had she had beat Cat, and she had lost to Holly. Yeah. And she had, well, she had lost to Holly, beat Cat, and then you right. fought her. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and then you, quick turnaround, you fought Cyborg. Yeah, like two months later, like yeah, eight weeks that's later. so. That's one of the things that Rich and I have talked about a lot before with the women's division is that, especially when you were coming up, the women's division was was being developed. So it's like you got a really fast turnaround to fight, arguably the pound for pound best in the world at the time. Yeah, that was the fastest turnaround I ever had. I mean, uh, most people start their camp, you know. So it was like I was going home from a fight to get into camp again. So. A lot yeah. of your career, it was like a year in between every fight. Yeah, there was a lot of gaps for yeah. sure. And then there was like a couple times in the UFC where it was like, all right, you won, now get your next fight. I think it was going to happen again um, after I beat um, Sara in 2020. It was Feb- the last day of February in 2020. I was supposed to fight for the title then um, in like May 5th. So that would have been like a really close turnaround too. Obviously, COVID like postponed the fight by a month. So second closest turnaround <laughs> yeah but i was in camp that whole time though so it felt like a long sure camp. were, were yeah. you still working um when i beat zara i so that was like, like i said february um and i knew i was going to be fighting i was like i'm fighting for the title next so i you know told my work with Florida virtual i was like hey they all they all watched my fight they were like super they loved that i was like following my like trying to like get to my dream you know yeah. so they were super supportive of it so i was like hey i'm gonna take a leave of absence and then i ended up, i was like i ended up just not you know like hey i'm just gonna like keep going so i stopped at that point so it was right at the beginning of camp for new is when i stopped uh working and was like just fighting you yeah know what I mean? so and um, then obviously you you went to decision with new uh with Nunez. Mm-hmm. um and and did obviously lose the decision. How how did looking back now, you know, maybe I shouldn't ask this, but I will. <laughs> oh boy. You know, <laughs> Cyborg's incredibly tough. Was Nunez a, a level above that, or was would you feel like they were just different? Yeah, I guess just different. But I feel like I had. Um, had a lot more opportunities to try to work my game on cyborg okay. like i got her against the fence um you know I, obviously the elbow whatever <laughs> <laughs> um with nunez it was like she was just always like one step ahead of me i felt like like i never yeah. really got her against the fence um the only time we we're on the ground she was on top of me you know <laughs> i mean same thing with cyborg at that point but um but yeah it felt like she was just like a step ahead of me and it was just like harder to to get my moment You're, to yeah. get in 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 your game right. i think yeah. i think a, a good point to mention as you said uh covid pushed the fight back by a month this is probably one of the very first pay-per-views right that came it might have been uh-huh. the first it pay-per-view. was the first pay- pay-per-view in covid era yeah yeah so the it was probably the one or second fight with no crowd yeah and you yep. always had a crowd so yeah it's it a very different fight. feeling yeah. i remember who are you training it. with were you training with anybody? Just I was this poor him. guy. <laughs> no, I was training. W- so when COVID started, um, I so it was like obviously everyone locked down, whatever. So we would we would go to the gym and have two people come. So I was training with um, I think I was training with Megan and Drew. Pretty sure. 
Um, <laughs> obviously, Mike was there. So in the cage, we would do our rounds. Maybe Alec. I think Alec was there too. Either way, um, so we were. I was doing like an hour in the morning at, at the jungle. Um, we were, you know, we made it work so that if you know, it was COVID. Yeah. Uh, you know, following the guidelines. And then guidelines are always changing too. Right. So, so it was like we were filming it for, for teaching people, whatever. <laughs> we were ready. Um, but then also I would do that in the morning, and then I would usually meet Grindel at the park. Um, you know, luckily we live relatively in the park. close. Yeah. So like we would meet on the tennis court or like I, on, I I on remember you guys posting like photo or video yeah. or something. Yeah. And I'm like, are they on a tennis here court I, right yeah. now? As, as a coach, it's I'm a like, tennis court? here I am coaching a fighter for a UFC title. This on is a like, tennis court. This is like every coach's dream, every athlete's dream. And we're like, yeah. we're on a basketball court right. today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Like literally every session we had almost in that basketball court, like on the tennis court was this couple always playing. Yeah. And I'd always think like, they don't even know. You're fighting People for like, a title excuse me, and like we play basketball here, <laughs> sir. Yes, I'm sorry, we're yeah. in your way. It worked out great, though. I mean, like, got tan. I don't know. <laughs> I was gonna say. I mean, it was it was really solid training. Yeah, uh, I thought so. So, again, like a lot of people don't know every detail of everyone's fight camp. So you're not the only example. But as a coach, I use you as an example all the time because so many of your fights, I know you went into either injured or some type of life events happening. And of course, before your title fight, finally you made it here. <laughs> You're right. It's COVID. COVID, you know, a pandemic happens. How mm -hmm. often does that happen? So Felicia's always like risen above a lot of these, um, you know, injuries or, you know, events that take place. Like, you know, you got a scar in your head cause you got cut in training before one of your fights and no one knew. I didn't know. Um, I remember Megan yeah. told me right before the fight and she's like, I'm so nervous. Oh, no. I was like, why are you nervous? She's like, I cut her in training. You know, <laughs> it's going to open up. Um, I remember one camp you had like a broken thumb or something. So for like the whole camp, she's holding her ponytail. So she like never had to grab or punch with it. Yeah. And yeah, really? Yeah. Just so many adversities that Ugh. go before the fights that Felicia's always, and she doesn't brag about it. She doesn't tell people. Those were usually like the the good outcomes too. I felt like I would go into them like, I got to finish this now. <laughs> yeah. right. So, you know, but going like, into the COVID thing, I knew like, like if Felicia's down to do it in a park, like, yeah, we have no excuses. We're, yeah. we're going to get it done. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah, I was ready. I was ready to go in there and win that title too. So I was definitely never like a, a doubt, you know, with, with the situation. Cause I'm like, well, it was her situation probably wasn't the same. She probably owned a gym or something, but Oh, um, I know she was in right. ATT headquarters. Right. They let her. Oh, yeah, 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 they do yeah. whatever they want, I guess. But uh, but funny story about that cut um that you mentioned for Invicta. So it was five weeks before my fight and it was I mean, the scar is worse than you know, a lot of them. But uh <laughs> <laughs> Um but I for me it's like almost like a badge of honor. I'm like uh, just like, as a reminder of what it um, the feeling after the fight when I won it, I was just so happy it didn't split open. <laughs> um, but I, I got cut five weeks before the fight and it was really deep. And I, uh, I had Invicta coming to film like 10 days later. So they were coming to film their, uh, through the ashes series, which is a great series. It was on YouTube, like a big 20 minute, like documentary, just about me, all eyes on me. So I was like, Oh, well, I can't let them know I got cut. So that's actually how my, headband got started because i was like i would like bandage up my scar and then i would put a head headband on and just so that the filming wouldn't know you know obviously and they wouldn't like pull me from the fight or that yeah. my opponent wouldn't know so that's when i started to wear the headband and then then i i ran with it and I actually sold headband it was like a big, big thing deal. for me for a while like the phenom headbands were like um i would always take pictures of them and, and then stuff so that's where it actually came from is because i was just hiding your injury, your injury. <laughs> so where did the funny. name phenom come from um it was actually just someone from the gym someone who used to teach kids class with me after i won my first or second amateur fight they were like in a facebook comment it was like that was phenomenal <laughs> <laughs> like you know because people would call me fee so fee was like a nickname yeah one fee f-e-e -E. Um, so phenomenal, you know, it was just, and then I was just like, I like that. And then it kind of stuck. That's how a fight yeah. name sticks. It was yeah. either that or spin cycle. <laughs> Cause she would spin a lot in the gym from the right. Taekwondo days. Yeah. Really? Spin yeah. Kicks, spin hook kicks. So there was a moment in the gym where we're like, Felicia, spin cycle, Spencer. Phenom. <laughs> no, that yeah, that's yeah. terrible. Yeah, I think Horrible Grindle, branding. Oh Grindle was really pushing that I was one. pushing spin <laughs> cycle Wow. Hard. Never. Never. Yeah, yeah. Embarrassing. <laughs> I would. Uh, we couldn't have you on the podcast. This is why I don't nickname my fighters. I let <laughs> spin it, I'm cycle. So bad. I'm so bad. Spin cycle. 
You thought that was a good idea? He yeah, thought that 100%. was in the second place running. Like, <laughs> <laughs> wow. No. This is this is that's one of those lessons where I'm like, I should not pick fight names because oh, my spin cycle. Come on, man. Uh, um, good try. Good try. So and then you retired on a win in the UFC. That's true. Did you know going into before the fight that that was going to be it for you? Yeah, I knew. What do you think? Um, like, what was the catalyst, or what do you think? was in your head at that time so um so way back when i started fighting i kind of had this idea in my head that i wanted to stop fighting when i was 30 okay which like in hindsight seems kind of early but when you're 20 it seems yeah. like a long career when you're you know 20 I mean? 30 feels like death yeah and, you, and you've does. been training martial arts yeah, your whole life right i've been getting kicked in the head since i was you know four years old so <laughs> um but yeah so i thought okay Hey, I'll do this for I'll do this until I'm 30, being competitive and like do what I can. I mean, like we said, when I was 20, there was no UFC dream. It was just like do what I can. Um, uh, uh, probably think, back then, like Hook and Shoot was like the biggest women's organization. And Victor and, probably just started. And back then, I didn't know what that was. Exactly, I did. <laughs> right? <No. laughs> but but then that's where you had fighters yeah. like Roxanne Modafferi and right. and you know yeah. some Rosie Sexton, some of these like right. really pioneer women. Yeah. Because you know we always say women's MMA is ten years behind. Yeah. It really is more like fifteen twenty because of just how right. inactive women's MMA was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. So I think like in the back of my head, that was always like a countdown that I had. Like even when I got signed to the UFC, I was like, I think I was 20, I was almost 27. And I was like, I only got three years to get this done, you know, <laughs> <laughs> in, in my head. I feel like it was, and I never really, I don't think I ever even told Todd that. Like, I don't think it was even something I like really said out loud, but I was just like, that in was the head, timer that I you had. had an expiration. Yeah. So I was like, and then when I was, you know, t uh, 29, I was uh fight or i think i was about no i was 29 when i had my last fight um and well there was a lot that kind of like went on before that so i'll back up a little bit too so um prior to my fight with norma so my second to last fight about six months prior to that um i lost my brother so that obviously big event in your life yeah and i feel like part of that was also like well for a while i was just like fighting like you know, just kind of uh, like doesn't seem like a really important thing anymore. Um, like I really just wanted to like have a, you know, take time with my family and yeah. blah, blah, blah. Um, but at the same time, I was like, you know, my goals, you know, like I have like aspirations. So like it wasn't ever like I didn't want to fight again. It was kind of almost just I don't know. It was kind of hard to explain. Like the motivation was kind of. Like, what's really important, it didn't feel like fighting anymore, you know? Yeah. Um, although my brother loved that I was a fighter, so it was also kind of like, well, I can't just stop, you know? So yeah. it, was, it was like a weird, complicated time, you know, obviously. Um, but then at the first fight after that happened, I lost. And I was like, well, that's not going to be okay. <laughs> so, uh, so I was like, well, I'm definitely not done now. So I had to go. I had to go out on a win, you know. Well, I'm, and who knows what would have happened if I lost the last fight? But after I won that fight, I was like feeling like I was like, all right, I was about to turn thirty, feeling good about where I'm at. Yeah. Um, it would be nice to keep making like I was kind of about to a point six fights into my UFC career that was pretty, getting pretty happy with the paycheck, you know, getting better. Yeah. So it was kind of hard on in that sense, but then I was like. Am I really just going to fight for money? Because I never really wanted to do that either. You know what I mean? Like just money. Did um, so. so obviously you retired in November of 2021. It's been two years. Do you still train? Yeah, I was yeah. at the gym this morning. Yeah, not as often. Obviously, not as often. <laughs> but I, I mostly do jujitsu. I mostly grapple. Yeah, but yeah. I'm around the gym. We, we did a seminar recently. Um, and she was my partner. It was the Sanchez seminar. Yeah, the, the Sanchez Yoke seminar. Had. And as we're like warming up, she's like, oh, this is the first time I've done striking since I retired. <laughs> <laughs> Shame. <laughs> oh, no. I'm, like, I'm sorry. You know, I don't know how this happened, but I haven't done any mitt work or striking for like a year and a half. Have it you? didn't show. It didn't show. <laughs> there were there were no. some things I was a little disappointed with, but for do the you, most part, she made do it. Do you miss that like competitive feeling? Um, not really, you know, I feel like a, a lot of the competitiveness was like me just proving to myself that I could do stuff, 
Okay. Because I feel like when I was younger, like self confidence was kind of a you know a problem. So martial arts was always like, I can do that, or I I'm not sure if I can do that, and then I did it, so that feels good. So kind of like that progressed through my career, like. I don't know if I could win the title, but then if I would have done it or when I did win the Invicta title, that was pretty awesome, you know? So like kind of, can I do that? And then being like, yeah, I can do that. And then making it happen made me grow, I guess. I don't know, whatever you want to call it. There was, there was a point I remember, and I've joked about this with you before, uh, when Felicia first became a pro and we're, you know, training for those first couple of fights, I was like, you know, this is a good time to go pro because at some point, you know, you're going to be at the top and cyborg will be retired and there won't be, there won't be any other, you know, so, you know, that, that trajectory that you had super fast, your, your amateur career, so slow, right? Yeah. Until those tough enough fights came on, it took like a year, two years between each fight. And then the Rachel Wiley fight, your pro debut happened. I think it was like almost two years after that you did your featherweight debut. It, 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 there's a, it was quite a while. A bit it was of time. like a year, yeah, I think. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it was very slow for amateur and then very fast. And I was I was kind of happy about it, too. Like, at the same time, it's like, man, it kind of sucks to jump straight into the lion's den. But, um, like I said, in the back of my head, I kind of had that, like, ticker going. Like, I got, yeah. I got three years left, four years left, you know. So. Did you have any specific things you did to mentally prepare for fights? Um, nothing, nothing really like, um, ritualistic, I guess, like no thing I had to do. Okay. Um, I think I really just always prepare, like focus on training and just like, what am I working on right now? And like, just trying to get better at that. Like I didn't, didn't have a lot like, uh, mental like train, you know, like yeah. videos or like mantras or something like that. I didn't do a lot of that. When you, how did you come down from losses? Did it, was that hard for you or did you kind of uh, roll off the back on that one? Or uh, I feel like I, I always had pretty good perspective on like, okay, I lost, but like it's a fight. It's not like yeah a real problem to have, you know? Um, although it hurts, obviously it stings and, um, physically hurts, Quite, quite physically yeah. hurts, but like more so like, yeah, of course it mentally hurts, yeah. but like, I feel like in the back of my head, I was always like, okay, this is not like a real human problem to have, like that I lost a fight. I'm still alive and I, you know, yeah, I have a, you know, have, I'm grateful. Sure. But I think we've all known <laughs> fighters that could not recover from losses or that had that True. problem. Um, yeah, I guess it's. I don't know, like how, and it's like when people lose, it's like there's not really like anything good to say to them. You yeah, know I mean, it's so, so it's kind of like hard at so that. Awkward. But like, I think maybe you have to just be prepared before you fight, or just like happy enough, like with w- what you have to offer your future. Like, if I didn't think my future held anything, losing a fight would be horrifying because that's my future. You know what I mean? Whereas, like, I always knew when I was done fighting. I would have a next step and that I don't know what that is at the, you know, at the time. I didn't know what my next step was, but I know whatever effort I put into fighting, I would put into the next thing and I would be fine. Yeah. So like for me, it was like, I always knew my future held something else awesome that I would enjoy and like work hard at. So maybe just like not realizing that about yourself would make it really hard and traumatic to lose a fight because that's everything that you're trying to do right now. Yeah. You know what I mean, so it's tough, but what do you got for me rich um we just kind of go into that i again i got to coach fee and i feel like and i've said this to uh i got spoiled because fee's not someone you had to like hey where you at you need to come to the gym yeah hey you need to do an extra round you need like she's always going to take care of that and i think that kind of plays into <laughs> that same mentality where you're just like you know you're willing to do the hard work because there, there's always something to be done and you're always willing to like just move on and do it and it sucks and you don't want to do it but you know it's going to lead you to higher more prosperous grounds would there be anything that you that would interest you in coming out of retirement is there a fight that you never had that you wanted or you know not really a fight um I mean, there would be like a number, I guess, that could get me out, but not. Like, there, there is a dollar amount like that we can get you to fight for again. Not write like that, a reasonable. Write that number yeah, <laughs> right? I've got like twelve dollars in my bank account. Right we'll start. Now. We'll start a GoFundMe. Yeah, yeah, we like, could do something. There would be 
be numbers that would like make me be like, well, I don't want to. I'll do that. I'll give it my all and get come back. But, <laughs> but like in reality, like not really. Like I feel, um, I be and again because like there was no end game when I started. It was like every step that I took was like already a dream come true. Like yeah, the fact that I made it to Invicta was like I made it, and then it was like. I got on a YouTube video from Invicta. I made it. I literally broke down crying in a Walmart because I saw the video. <laughs> like, well, I was cutting weight too, but <laughs> I saw the video got posted and I started crying. If um, And then, you know, every step it was like a dream come true. So I feel pretty like fulfilled from it. If you were restarting your career today from the beginning, um, now that there is a path, now that there, there are these very well-known female fighters, do you think that you would have you would have had put that expiration date in your head that I'm done 30 or do you think that that maybe that wouldn't have existed? That's a really good question. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of hard to like imagine that. Yeah. Um, I feel like had I like, had I won the title, right? Like the, the UFC title. Yeah. I feel like the expiration date would have been postponed. Would have changed. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's not like, Oh, I, failed this time I give up but it was like I was just like going 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 and trying to see the next level and then I always like I said I had said a long time ago like if I didn't think I could be the best I wouldn't even bother and like I think there's a part of me that thought like well I think I might have reached like not my best but I knew Amanda was better than me <laughs> and I do believe like I can still beat people who are better than me because I feel like I've done it a few times. Like they're better than me, but I beat them in a fight because I just like have had something or had a moment um, or just like have that like tenacity to like keep going. Yeah. Even though they might be better than me on paper. Um, so it's not like I gave up, but I feel like certain things could have extended it um, because like, your life really changes if you're the UFC champion. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, so I don't know. It's hard to, kind of hard to answer your question, yeah. I guess. Um, well, how, how about this? When young f fighters, when you talk to young fighters, is there advice that you give them repeatedly or are there, is there certain things that you wish that you, you know, would have told your younger self that you didn't? Um, well, let me actually, let me kind of answer that last question because – the fact that I was taking um, a lot of damage for a few fights, not just a few, I took, you know, a pretty good amount of damage for a number of my last fights, um, particularly Cyborg and Nunes. Um, I feel like that really played into like me really accepting my decision to stop fighting. Whereas if I was like in the beginning of my career, basically not getting hit for a lot of my career, yeah. Then it would be like, keep fighting. It's like, why would you stop? Like, you're not taking any damage. You know, do your thing. So I feel like that that would also play the part. Where it's like, um, if I wasn't taking damage, I would keep going. Yeah. Um, but then your your mention about like advice. Um, yeah, I feel like part of the. Well, I wouldn't like tell a young fighter to like think about stopping like think about that far like when should you stop because it really all those variables are in play but i do think it's important to have like a the the game after like i was saying like i always know what's that next up whatever's next even if you don't know what it is you know this experience of like having to work hard will carry through to the next step of your life so don't be afraid of it right um because you'll be awesome at whatever you put your mind to so whether it's fighting now or something else later so like don't be afraid of that and train smart like yeah. i'm all i have definitely like mentioned to a number of people like training hard does not actually make you really better although you need like hard training in the beginning i think like some yeah. points you're talking about taking damage and training. taking damage yeah taking damage and <laughs> training is like i feel like to a point it's important in certain parts like in the beginning maybe a, a little bit of testing yourself not in the very beginning <laughs> once you start to really get competitive um, <laughs> because like I kind of am grateful that like I had a lot of training that really tested me but at the same time it's like it's really not necessary for most of it yeah especially once you know that you can like handle once you know how you react to damage 
you don't need to ever take that again. Like you don't really ever need that to get better. You know what I mean? One of the things I, I've said on the podcast before and I, I've said a couple times is like I was having a conversation with Forrest Griffin and Forrest Griffin was saying like the number one thing that I wish I wouldn't have done would have been in sparred all those rounds and training because I didn't right. need them. I didn't need to take that damage. Yeah. But it's funny because young fighters always want to spar more. They always want to be more involved in the fire. Right. It's not necessarily it's, the thing. Yeah. No. And I've, I feel like p- people have changed a little bit. You sure. Know? I feel like it has gotten well a lot better than like one 10, 15 years ago, you know, kind of training. Um, I feel like a lot of it has to do with like the coaches, Yeah. you know, like the mentality that your coach has is going to translate to the experience that you have in training. So it is important to like recognize that <laughs> wherever you, you're at. And through your career, you always had, you always had Mike Lee as like your head coach. Yeah. I always stayed with the jungle with, um, by training. And I mean, obviously even when Grindel wasn't with, with the jungle, I kept, because you know, we had such a good, like, rapport and like i really trusted his insight did you feel pressure when you got into the ufc to go to to move or to do to train in somewhere bigger i received a lot of like pressure but i never like felt the weight of it yeah really like um i did feel like um it would be good i do feel like it is good to train elsewhere yeah right um and that's something i actually made a point to try to do in the very last bit of my career, like, like before my last fight, for example, I went to New York to train with Matt Sarah's team for like two days, like really short amount of time. Um, and I was like being, trying to be a little bit more open to it. Like I would cross train around locally a little bit too. Um, a little bit, but I feel like that was always kind of something that I actually did struggle with was like, again, I think it comes down to like the confidence. Like I feel like, um, I never wanted to let myself down training with someone else that I didn't know what to expect over there. Yeah. And it was like scary, you know, like to go somewhere else. And then people always, when you're like, you know, I was always a high rank for my whole career. So it's like, you got a target. I don't know if I'm going to get hurt and I don't yeah. know if I'm going to show up and like, do I need to be like oh, yeah. competitive? So it was always really scary. And I would say, um, I, I, you know, if I was telling myself something, I guess I would be, to try to put myself out there and cr- and go elsewhere to train. Yeah. Not even like, I mean, locally is great, but like go places just to train because that like pressure, that the anxiety that you feel in that new gym and like your unexpected training partners, that is actually, I think really valuable that yeah. I could have done more. Something I always told Fee, uh, she needed to use her fame more <laughs> when she, <laughs> when she was signed to the UFC and you know, everyone knows who she is. Yeah. Um, you know, I was saying, reach out to these gyms. You know, they they would love to have you. Why you would they want the? You know, you didn't have any like big, uh, uh, brand endorsements or any like of all the fighters. Like you, you probably could have done a lot more of that, right? Um. Yeah, and I probably part of that is that I didn't ever get a management team. Okay. Which I'm I'm also happy about because, well, for me it was kind of unique because, the featherweight division was this big small if you're listening (laughs) um (laughs) so i knew especially once i got like so i started off in invicta i already had the platform for invicta you know yeah i'm winning fights what else am i supposed to do to get a title shot win fights and then when i got the ufc call it was like well i never felt like i needed a management team because when the ufc needs a featherweight who are they gonna call yeah me so i already knew i had my foot in the in the door in a sense if i just waited and won the title i knew that next step once it was available would be there so i didn't feel like a manager was something i needed um i never felt like i needed someone else to talk for me at the to make you know what i mean yeah um but i also recognize that my situation is very unique because most people are not in a division forming that way having the opportunity so in that sense yeah. i get that it was not the same as other people um so I think part of that, if I had like a, a bit, and I'd had lots of people reach out to manage, like all, yeah. all the big management firms, you know, would reach out, but I was just like, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. So do you look back on that and go like maybe just for even endorsement deals or whatever? Um, I don't really like regret it, but I mean, it would be something to explore like at the right time. And I, I don't really know what the right time would have been really. Yeah. Um, because I got signed on in, in it seems like pretty much i got signed on like everyone pretty much gets signed on not everyone but there's like that starting level in the ufc and then 
so I, my second fight in the UFC was Cyborg. And, of course, naturally, they try to get me to fight Cyborg for that first deal. <laughs> I'm yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Um, I specifically said, if I'm fighting Cyborg, that's not on my contract. <laughs> that's a different contract. <laughs> uh, so, you know, and, it, and I also had, like, so Todd, you guys know Todd. He's very, like, he's going to say what's on his mind. So, luckily, I had that person next to me that I felt like not managing me, but Backing making sure that yeah. I'm not getting taken advantage Supporting of. You, like, he's yeah. never going to let someone get taken advantage of in front of him um, yeah you know good or bad whatever it is like he he's on it so like he was like are they trying to get you to fight cyborg for fifteen thousand dollars what <laughs> no <laughs> it's like because i'm like well i signed a contract so and he's like no that's not gonna happen so it's like in a sense i had i had the right like people in my ear you know yeah I mean? that's positive so, yeah um so that's important yeah. is there like a so you got to fight Cyborg, and obviously you were probably like a big fan of Cyborg. Was there any like other fighters or moments where you felt like starstruck being in the, the highest level? Because I, I know you again from your first days as an amateur. So I remember specifically, I'll give you one of my instances, okay. your uh, Invicta debut. We went to like an after party, <laughs> and Tanya Evinger was there, and she had just won the main event that night and you're like oh i want to talk to tanya and you're so <laughs> nervous in the corner was there any other moments like that um that's really funny yeah and in, in invicta it was very i was the new girl too so I was like, and then like um you know julie kezzy and stuff i was like they were all women's uh idols i guess not idols but they're all pioneers and icons yeah, you know, you know yeah. for their time so that was cool and, uh, and i was like i'm the first fight of the night on the undercard my debut i don't think i'm worthy so like a lot of that you know i don't want to interrupt people blah blah, blah. i will um, say the way you finish that fight <laughs> so our our game plan going into that you know felicia's signed she's the new girl she's opening the card she's the new basically the face of the lightweight division like you were saying that veronica girl was on her way out so we were like, you should go out there and elbow this girl and cut her up and make her bleed. Really send the <laughs> message, right? Really send the message. And Felicia goes out there, lands, I don't know, 10 to 20 elbows and, you know, strikes to the face. Not a single cut. <laughs> but this girl's face had morphed. So we're like, this yeah. is like the oh, beginning of memes. Man. And people were like making her look like sloth from the Goonies. Oh, man. I mean, you battered that girl within one round to... She was a Hooters model, but no more. <laughs> oh, my God. It, there is a weird thing where it's like, you know, every level, like, you run into that next level of fighter, you know, where, like, that girl probably thought that she was great, and then she ran into Felicia, and she's like, oh, this is there's a different level here that I'm not a fan of, you know? Um, so many of the girls you fought, I, I bring this up to you, I call Felicia the career killer, because killer, so many girls she fought, they were either undefeated or had a pretty strong record. Then they run into fee, never again. Yeah, they, they, they would quit, and they were good girls. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's what was so unfortunate was probably my first like ten fights yeah. almost, almost yeah. all of them, other than almost. Macy, Macy Kiesa. Macy, yep, Macy, and then we talked about Jennifer. Um, she kept fighting. Um, but almost all the girls that yeah. Felicia beat, not even like the ones we went to the decision. Aquila, that girl was yeah. terrifying. Madison, Matt yeah. Um she crossfit girl. Yeah, she yeah. Was, um, but to answer your question yeah. about, I would say um, the the cyborg experience, like I kind of think of it as was like I was still new to the UFC. My first fight was on like a fight night, so it wasn't like the full like, pay per view experience. And then I became like the co main event of a pay per view in Canada, which they're like really you know well this is the American shirt. <laughs> <laughs> they're really like running me as a Canadian. They're like let's just dig into it, you know. It's her um, and GSP. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. 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 And uh, best and, friends. And Cyborg yeah. has a lot of Canadian fans too. So you're it was like, hard. why are people like her um, everywhere? <laughs> she's so nice. Um, she's a great lady. <laughs> um, when I when I arrived, so I had like the embedded crew that followed me from yeah. Florida for that week, and then they came like with me. So um, that was pretty pretty wild. And then like I remember when I arrived to like the UFC offices, like where we do the poster signing when we arrive, like the whole greeting thing. Um, and it was on embedded too. So like, I remember seeing Frankie Edgar, which he was the main event. And I think it just sticks with me because it was like made into a thing on the embedded that I was like, there's Frankie Edgar. Oh my God. That's so cool. <laughs> and then, uh, 
what I didn't know is Todd went to go talk to Frankie Edgar when I was like doing something and then Frankie was like oh hey can I come get a can I get a picture with you and he like took a selfie with me <laughs> like he approached me and then come to find out like after I you know embedded it's like oh Todd went to talk to him <laughs> but it was like on embedded it was adorable you yeah know? I was like oh so yeah that was uh that was pretty like uh memorable for me what was cyborg like um she has really nice eyes i remember okay. like the stare down like right. she's got like really vibrant eyes no she's really nice she's aside from like so fight week was kind of like the face off it was kind of like weird at first i thought she was like really abrasive be but she was just having like a beef with dana i guess so yeah so she was Famously, abrasive to me yeah. because she was trying to like be addicted to dana and she's trying to kill you right yeah and fair. i'm still like In hey. <laughs> shake my hand um so she like snubbed my handshake on the the face-offs or whatever um but no she was very like complimentary and nice and open to me like after we fought and um i've seen her at events many a few events since then and sits down with me hangs out you know like we talk we're, we're it's it's good she's probably the person i've seen the most after i fight actually <laughs> since you've retired or have you, you've done i know you've done commentary mm -hmm. what else have you had do you still go to fights um i go to some fights yeah. um do you still follow the sport yeah i mean not as much as i could i got like a you guys know the sport a lot more than me, you know. I don't know if that's um, the pretty like, rich does. I, I do. I'm, I'm no, a massive you for rich sure does. Does. You still watch every Invicta. You're way ahead rich, of me. Rich buddy. does, yeah. Um, no, no, that's life. great though. No, um, like I keep up with the headlines. Like I'm, I'll check the headlines. Like you know, yeah. not every day, but you know, I'll check them a lot. Um, like I follow all the big outlets on social media and stuff, and I follow it. Um, as far as watching it, like I really haven't bought. I could probably count on my hands the number of pay-per-views I've ever bought, like ever. Fair. But that's just like how I, that's just how I am. I'm cheap yeah. anyway. Like if I'm not with a group of people, it doesn't seem worth it. I'm not just gonna buy a pay-per-view for myself. I feel myself. like they should give you free pay-per-views for um, life. I if remember you fought, when I right? fought on ESPN Plus, and I was like, literally the day of my fight, I think I got a notification that my uh, subscription renewal, like my draft of ESPN Plus you know 4.99 was coming out that day and i was like i'm seriously getting charged for espn plus <laughs> while i'm fighting on espn plus mm -hmm. it's just not part of the package i got free uh fight pass yeah for the time i was in <laughs> so I was which like, is nice because no one's then, ever watched fight then, pass it, well, since then it was like when i first got signed to the ufc those fight nights were on fight pass and yeah then by the time my first fight happened they were on espn plus so i was like well i gotta pay for my own fight <laughs> So that was a weird moment. Um, favorite walkout music ever? Um, I almost always walked out to Queen. Okay. Um, and just like, I don't know, just something. Uh, once I started, once I had my first Queen walkout, I was like, that was great. And then I was like, they got a whole bunch of good stuff. And like, <laughs> yeah, it's like, I always liked Queen, but I was never like a diehard fan of Queen, you know? Uh, like you are of Kiss, right? You like Kiss? No, I, 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 I mean, I somewhat. You, not okay. as much as Rich does, apparently. I don't have any like figurines of. I Queen. well, I do have a lot of toys. <laughs> I don't have any toys of Queen. See, when I was but. a child, I saw the Peter Pan movies, <laughs> and I thought never growing up seemed like a great yeah. idea. <laughs> so you can just get the toys. And I've just continued to purchase things that I shouldn't purchase because I have. Um, so so Queen, right? Um, but you know, I'm I'm thinking of an instance in in New Orleans. Where yes. uh, that was a pretty interesting. If you want to tell so that like, story, initially when I started to fight, I was like, when I can pick a walkout song, I, I so I loved Heart growing up. Okay, my dad liked Heart in the '80s rock band. If you don't know, they have a lot of hits, but not like something super popular now. Barracuda, um, exactly. Still pretty Barracuda is like the one. So I really always wanted to come out to Barracuda because I was just I always liked Heart and it was a great like pumped up song. So I kept trying, but like the first fight I couldn't pick. And then I don't remember what happened the second time. So the third fight, I was like, I'm getting Barracuda. So we go to New Orleans and they're like, um, what walkout song? And they're like, it's going to be Pandora. So it's going to be potentially random, but you might get lucky. <laughs> so um, <laughs> so, so the we're DJ, like, the DJ only had Pandora. Pandora. So you, so put you would type the artist. Heart, oh, you know, regional MMA is heart, best. Heart Barracuda. And then if you know, uh, like Heart has a lot of slow songs too. One of them's called Alone. I'm pretty sure that was the one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Alone. So I wanted Barracuda and then 
alone comes on and i'm just walking out to like this slow song what is that dj and doing today it's, <laughs> it's it's already bad enough because we're in this girl's home territory yeah she's in hometown, and you're now yeah. all alone <laughs> it was the slowest worst walkout i just remember right. like it doesn't matter fee just keep going like, just keep and walking just like, fee. i'm just like we're laughing okay it, yeah. well, it was already a weird warm-up like we had like a oh yeah it was like a fish kitchen with like it Mud. smelled of fish. Poor oh, fish. Good lord. And then the fire alarm was going off the whole warm up. The entire warm up. And we're in the hallway yeah. of a concrete building, and the fire alarm was just like, burr, right next to burr, us. And we're just hitting mids. I'm like, God, <laughs> damn it, I can't wait to go all fight. <laughs> and then a loan comes on, and then my, luckily, Macy picked like ACDC or something. Back like, in black. It was like, all right, all right. <laughs> it, it, it hyped me yeah, up because yeah. I was like, I needed something. Yeah, that was I bad. think he needed it more than me. Because <laughs> I was just like, I was kind of like, well, this is hilarious enough to give me energy, I guess. Like, I don't know. But that was pretty funny. That's crazy. Um, but yeah, then I think after that, I pretty much started to do Queen Just from pick there Queen on every out. time, yeah. yeah. Smart. You can't so, go wrong with Queen yeah. on Pandora, obviously. Right, yeah. They have yeah, so they many good have ones. I tried good. to knock off a bunch of them. Got most of the ones I wanted. So, yeah. Yeah. If you fought again, would there be, like, that one song that you... Uh, I'm trying to set up a fight for you. Right? That's what I'm doing you right are. now. Um you want I mean, to do some I PMT? Would, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would do Queen again. I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I like the, if it's in a stadium, like a big crowd, we will rock you. Yeah. Because then the whole crowd does the whole thing. Yeah. Um, and I liked uh, Can't Stop Me Now. Was a re- I really liked that one a lot. Yeah. yeah. What interactions have you had with fans? Or like, what was it like going from being kind of like obscure to probably most MMA fans knowing your name? Um. It was, I mean, it was cool for sure. Like yeah. I really, it was like flattering to get recognized. Like I got recognized at Walmart once. Really? Yeah. Like it was cool. Um, I mean, it was definitely like a reminder that people like, you never know who Watches. is like a, like a fan or yeah. like it could be anywhere. Like most of the time, no one knows who, the, you know, who I am. But then it's like in the back of your head, it's like, someone might know who you are. You better act right, you know? Like yeah. <laughs> someone might, usually not, but there's always like that chance. No, but it, it was definitely like really flattering. And um, I'd say because of like who I stayed as a, f- like a personality, like I feel like I pretty much stayed true to myself and a lot of like um, gratitude would come my way from yeah. like parents or just like people who are, similar to me or like just people who were grateful for who I was and who I was portraying. So that felt like really good and really like helped me be like, okay with the fact that I was just staying true to myself and like not pretending to be something I wasn't, even though I, you know, I love the game of MMA and like the personality shifts that people can do. Um, I think that's needed and awesome. Like people who can play the heel or like, put on the show but i also think it's really important to have like those personalities that are like humble and yeah you know kind of like so that was just kind of like i ran with that um much as i can appreciate the people who do other things um it worked for me and it was like greatly appreciated by a certain other people so it really helped me like stick yeah. with it yeah yeah, I mean, uh, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson comes to mind when it comes to, like, other fighters who just always keep it real, always respectful. They kind of have that martial arts. Mentality. What we imagine yeah. is a martial arts mentality. The opposite of the Colby Covington kind right, of. Right, like yeah. you're not creating a character and using hate as a way to fuel your career. I think that's one of the hard things about professional fighting. Because, like, you know, when you think about guys that like Conor McGregor or Colby Covington that created this kind of persona, that's probably a lot bigger than they really that that is not who they are, you know, mm. right. but they were able to use that persona to leverage essentially money. Yeah. And there's know? nothing like really wrong. I, and again, I, I think that's really necessary. I think sometimes all those examples might like have moments where they cross the line and it's like man you really probably shouldn't have done that but in like in that's hindsight for them like yeah they probably thought they were just sticking with their persona and then maybe they might have crossed the line but like it happens um again i i would never i would never be able to do it but you're not throwing uh, chairs through buses yeah you know like there's there's times where they cross the line but it's like it's like um it's like comedians who get in trouble sometimes it's like um they're funny until they're not, but then it's like, are they really, should they really get in trouble because they said something that they were just trying to like 
yeah. be funny about. You know what I mean? But sometimes I know what you mean. Like, <laughs> sometimes it's really not funny what the MMA personalities are doing. Um, I think there's like it, a it, line it, that's hard to. It's hard to like. Maybe it's hard for them to like s- recognize the line. <laughs> I think a lot of times with the the combat sports athletes, it's really where they're at in their career. Because if you're at the top, it seems like you can say anything and people are for it. But if you're on like a losing streak or something and you're talking smack, you're you're being disrespectful. Then guys are like, yeah, not approving. True. Um, so you saw the you know the sport evolve a lot from when you started till today. Do you see that continued evolution? Like, where do you think uh, MMA goes from here? Um, I feel like it's as unknown. You know, the future is as unknown as it as it was like for us looking at looking yeah. forward years ago. You know, um, I mean, I feel like it'll just kind of stay the course. Like we, you know, we always kind of think, oh, hey, we know what to expect. Like divisions will develop, and well, we have these divisions now that's it we're good and then new division pops up or something you know how do you feel about things like Uh, bare knuckle mma or like the loosening of the rules i i i'm not opposed to bare knuckle i wouldn't do it well i might i would i would be more inclined to do mma bare knuckle than like boxing bare knuckle Mm. um i mean the damage is like well it's it's superficial damage for the most part you know yeah but so i so for me it was like Man, like I thought it was hard to, to put gloves on and get in the face. <laughs> like I would do it for a lot of money, maybe. Yeah. But, <laughs> so um, just so we're on the same I'm page, like you big, you are open to doing bare knuckle MMA I mean, for the right dollar amount. I mean, I yeah, as I long would as do it. in your contract you can come out to Queen. Can we write that dollar amount down <laughs> on a piece of paper? I already sent it to them. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> you gotta buy me out of the. I'm still <laughs> under contract with the UFC. You gotta buy me out. Are you still under contract? Yeah, I have another fight on my contract. Yeah. Um, and then and then you can throw me that dollar amount. But mm-hmm. yeah, that's. Because they they had they had reached out with a, a possible really yeah yeah no I don't kidding know if I could say that um, but yeah it was like there's no way you're gonna throw that throw that money into it um, and, uh, and it's like it's well gonna they gave have Paige Van Zandt a million dollars right she's got so, a really big social media following <laughs> yeah but she can't fight <laughs> um, did I say that out loud yeah right. but okay you're just being so real. Um, but yeah, as far as like bare knuckle, I'm not opposed to it. Um, not like a big fan necessarily, but like yeah. I did like, you know, when I, when I know people who are doing it, I'm going to watch it, of course. And I, I enjoyed watching it. Um, yeah, definitely not like opposed to it. Uh, not never watched the slap thing. Never been a, you know, power slap, not you know, a power slap. Thing. That's not part of the same sport. No. That's not power slap's sport. weird, I think right? It's on Fight Pass though, isn't it? <sighs> no, it's owned by the UFC though, isn't it? Yeah, power yeah, slap, yeah. right? That's a very. This or is it's owned by Dana White. My issue with power slap is, and this is a weird segue, is that in any other martial art, you are legally or like you are part of the rule set is you defend yourself. Right, you're supposed to. You're supposed to defend yourself. Right, defend yourself sport. at all yeah. times. Yeah. I, you're just gonna smack each other. That's a bad. What's the strategy there? Here's here's the safer. Go version. first. Yeah, the safer version of power slap is flip a coin. That's that's if you were to take out the contact, you're just who gets to go first. Flip a coin. Yeah. Go first has to be. It's like Monopoly. Yeah. If you go first in Monopoly, you have a seventy-five percent chance of winning the Correct. game. Yeah, right. I, Statistics. I, I don't. Yeah, it's, it's psycho. Yeah. So going to a real sport, MMA. Um, <laughs> Ooh. In your career, you had, you know, decision wins, TKO wins, submission wins. Um, so obviously, you're very well versed. What techniques do you feel are like the most valuable for up and coming fighters to focus on? Because Again, I know you started with Taekwondo, but you weren't known as like a, a big stand up fighter, but you had it you have several fights where you couldn't score the takedown like you wanted, so you had to rely on your stand up. So what techniques do you think kind of really stand out to you? Um, I mean like first and foremost, like whatever you're good at. <laughs> <laughs> um but I I mean I always I always think of like the elbows, you know, like elbows were kinda like something I always really enjoyed doing and was good at so i superman elbow elbow from the clinch elbow from here or there um and i think um it's come i feel like a lot of gyms train it more now but like cage control was something that i really worked on very early in my career and got really good at and we always worked it like every week maybe even a couple times a week so like cage work was huge for for me and i think um, people are starting to come around to it, but it's definitely something that a lot of people, I think, still don't think about. Um, 
because most people in MMA are fighting in some kind of a cage or like they have walls. So it's it's a whole different game when you're on the wall rather than yeah. in the middle. Uh, so yeah, you didn't have a wrestling background, right? It was a jiu-jitsu right. background. Yeah, but jiu-jitsu, you had yeah. pretty high accuracy on your takedowns, but almost all of them came from the cage. Yeah, a lot of them. It's like I had some success with like setting them up with weird techniques like Superman's or certain kicks, which I always had like kind of a weird – like I enjoyed doing weird styles, <laughs> like weird things. Um, but, yeah, the, the cage was where I definitely like would call home. I felt safe felt like I was in control so that's definitely something I think a lot of people who are looking to like get really good and successful should focus on that a lot of cage control I I agree I mean uh you know again training with you so much I knew we wanted to get good at the open space striking but it always came down to we're using the striking to do what get to the cage to get them to throw so we can counter and press them on the cage or if we can score a takedown in between that, that'd be great too. Right. But like you said, it has almost like a safety net, like put yeah. them on the cage. Yeah. Even if you got turned, if your back's to the wall, you were always pretty comfortable. Some things that, you know, you did differently that a lot of other fighters don't really do is not only elbows in the, the clinch on the cage, but foot stomps, uh, very common in your fights, uh, knees to the thigh from that position. It wasn't just, you know, you know, your fight with Aquila. Yeah. She was put in a guillotine. <laughs> While she's in the guillotine, she brings Neater her knee the head. Yeah, yeah I that was a that. big highlight out of that fight. Yeah. So you had for sure some unique things, but I think like foot stomps, uh, we see Kamaru Usman use them. Um, yeah. But outside of that, we don't really see a ton of fighters utilizing that, and I think that's a big miss. Um, you're not going to get a stoppage from a foot stomp, but it makes the fighter react and it opens up your takedowns and your other strikes as well. So yeah. Yeah, to I your was... point, cage control, and I think little things like foot stomps and right i loved like i always call it, like creative striking like even on the like ground and pound like striking creatively on the ground was always just like so fun to train um like we always had a good time being like oh i'm how am i gonna hit you here like hit you from behind my back like i'd get like side control and like throw punches from behind like just being silly i feel like i'm i always uh i could probably attribute a lot of my like skill to me being silly in a lot of moments and just trying to try stuff and have fun and then that translated to like um being willing to try something new and i think a lot of that probably has to do with like not having an ego and like just trusting the people you're training with like they're not gonna have an ego if they get the better of you like they're not gonna make you feel like you know you failed you know so like just having like a good relationship with the training partners and like having fun is super huge for me at least for like having the confidence to try stuff and i think um just because he worked with him for so long that's something i picked up from mike as well as uh you know there's there's these core moves that you really want to get good at because statistically those are going to be the sure. best moves but mike always kind of made it a point like you said to kind of have fun do something a little wacky uh one technique i remember he would slap the mat and then spin into like an arm bar or knee bar or something <laughs> the behind the back punch that was something i remember mike doing yeah too many times to me (laughs) so uh little things like that for sure i think um you know to catch someone off guard we talked about in the finishing a fight podcast this concept that i i teach my students the distract destroy yeah and if you're always using the fundamentals which you should be using more often than not um it does become predictable so doing things a little awkward a little more creative breaks that rhythm and it kind of puts that fighter a step behind you because they're thinking like did they just punch me from <laughs> that right. position Where did that come from? <laughs> you know have, have you had any interest in in coaching on a more serious level or are you know, i know you're doing commentary um i i do enjoy coaching um i would i feel like it could be in my future yeah um it's definitely a very time consuming to be a good coach so i i recognize that and i'm like I don't know if I if I want that big commitment at the moment, but I love being a part of the gym and like going to train and giving my little two cents and just rolling, you know, being part of the experience. But to like be a head coach or to like be in that position is a lot of responsibility that I respect too much to try, not too much to try right now. I also maybe it's part of me just like. I'm not, I still feel like I'm not worthy. (laughs) Like I'm not good enough to do that. Even though I, you know, I'm sure uh, 
uh, people wouldn't be like opposed to me being a part of their coach coaching staff um maybe that kind of falls back on like that's a new territory that maybe i'm still not confident yeah. that i can do but I, even though i'm sure i think you'd be great at it. i mean you're a teacher right <laughs> yeah, so like I am a teacher. You, you know the teaching process you have the patience right. you obviously have the skill and knowledge so i just don't think you've <laughs> taken that step to right. try it out yeah um but i think you would do great at it yeah. honestly yeah. yeah it's a possibility yeah, they say that. they say the best students become the best teachers and you're a phenomenal student well, right thank you yeah. no no play on words yeah, yeah, yeah. but, <laughs> but you're, you're a really good student so like i think that would translate really well well to your why teaching. didn't you guys ever think of felicia the spin doctor spencer that's better than the thing you came up with but is it better than phenom no that's what i'm no, saying like once not, we heard phenom i was like yeah, yeah that makes sense it right. kills spin the spin doctor cycle. really commits me to always do you have a, you have a master's <laughs> degree or a ba just a bachelor's a bachelor's you have a bachelor's so if yeah. you ever get a phd i just want you to consider the spin doctor okay that's nice. <laughs> it's just there if you did have the phd yeah i, I mean would it's be, a game I would changer. Be, changer back on board with the okay spin doctor. Okay. okay i'm i'm right. just throwing it out there it's better than rich's idea <laughs> um right. is there any like other moments maybe uh through this conversation you may have thought of that isn't necessarily like pertaining to fighting but like around the scene of fighting a moment that like sticks out in your head as like unusual or entertaining maybe something just fascinating from the amateur days or even the pro days um i feel like we covered a lot of like the the things that well because we just talked about them they're popping into my head <laughs> um i don't know yeah i mean the training is always like it's always different, you know, so I don't know. Oh, I think, you know, people have asked me about like superstitions before and I always feel like it's a surprising answer that I say like there's that I um, feel like it's my superstition not to have a superstition, <laughs> like in the sense that if I wear like like in the beginning, I like I wore the same shorts twice and I was like. I can't keep wearing these shorts because then it's going to be like a thing Saying that I have to do thing, forever. Yeah. So it was like, I <clears throat> shouldn't, I shouldn't do the same thing twice uh, or three times ever because then it's going to be like a thing that I always have to do. Yeah. So I feel like sometimes people are surprised to hear that like I make a point to avoid doing Everything could be the that. same thing twice. So that it's not Who were your favorite fighters growing up? Like um, when you were coming up? I I mean naturally I liked GSP you know from Montreal I was born in Montreal yeah so that was a big thing um, have you I met also, him no I have not really I have not no can we make um, that happen that'd be awesome can we get GSP on the show do you think that I well, could you ask him I'll for reach me out to yep. him. thank <laughs> you thank you so much <laughs> uh, and I also when I first started watching I was a big fan of Rich Franklin who's also a math teacher I was gonna say can yeah. you guess why I'm sure everyone knows now but yeah so yeah he was a math teacher and I also enjoyed like you know he was a good fighter so yeah i mean did, until he ran it. into silva yeah, yeah. um so Oof. i enjoyed watching him and that was right around the time that i started to watch fights um he was already pretty well known like i i didn't really watch fights until like 2009 okay which was already pretty deep into like most yeah people's, deep deep yeah. Yeah. yeah like and i trained i was like i said i was a purple belt in jujitsu and like then one day i think the first night i watched a fight was um the guys I trained jujitsu with were doing a fight night and they're like, you should come. Like they've been training me for years. And they like, I was just always like, I got homework. You know, I got, I was very like book, you know, studious. Yeah. Very studious. Had taught at the, the Taekwondo school. I was busy, you know, either way. So they invited me to, to watch the fights and it was, um, Forrest Griffin and Anderson Silva that they fought, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah that yeah. was my first uh mma fight that i watched Forrest got clipped first. and ran back out he's um, like i'm good yeah. so that was ran back to the dressing room like, I, I mean he was running and crying yeah. yeah you know interestingly i heard from someone that his wife was in labor in the united states and he got out to brazil where they fought and literally they're like yeah your wife's in labor and he was like all right let's make this oh quick. i never heard that yeah yeah interesting and they he got clipped and he's like all right and he got up and he's like oh right, we gotta get to the hospital yeah. i mean he got clipped a couple times yeah yeah, yeah, but yeah the last one was pretty nasty I mean, he yeah. wasn't he wasn't gonna win that fight no that makes sense. yeah it was it was not for him right his husband was no but yeah so that was like how like most people are like dang you were training for a long time before you cared to watch a fight yeah. <laughs> well even even really? recent times when i would coach you and like one, one thing i do this is just a habit of mine is i watch every fight every weekend so like monday session or if it's a tuesday session or first session i'm like did you watch the fights this weekend nine times out of ten felicia's like no 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, well, all the examples I wanted to give you, <laughs> like, don't they're not relevant. One. Yeah. Or like a lot of the time, it's like I watch the maybe the undercard, but then I'm not buying the pay per view if I'm alone. <laughs> like it's just <laughs> sure. I'm not buying it. Um, but yeah, or. Yeah, I, I never really, it was never, like, a big point to, like, watch every fight. Um, yeah. Even, like, when I, when I was, like, watching a lot of fights, I thought it was, like, nothing compared to, like, what a lot of people do. <laughs> yeah. You know? Nothing compared to Grendel yeah. over here. Grendel, yeah. I mean, that's why he's the coach, right? Yeah, yeah fair. <laughs> Is there any, like, fighters nowadays that maybe you're you're a big fan of that are newer in the last two years since you've re- retired? Anyone stick out in your mind? Um, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, dang. It's like, let me think about women, I guess. Cause like my brain just won't function right now. <laughs> um, I'm excited about, um, Tatiana Suarez. Mm-hmm. I think she's cool. Um, the Bantamweight division, not like super crazy. Um, obviously featherweights are pretty much done for. So <laughs> my bad. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like that all kind of fell apart yeah. after I said I th- bye. There's been one or two featherweight fights. Yeah, there since. were. Yeah, like Norma beat uh, Chelsea Chandler, and then that was a weird one. You remember that one? Yeah, that was a weird one. Um, it's unfortunate because. But it was like she had such a good sense of humor after. I forget what she said, but it was like really funny on Instagram after. I love it when fighters can like have something weird happen or like lose, and then they're like funny about it after. <laughs> it it does seem like there's not like obviously, you know, Cyborg was the 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 that, poster child that was I the guess. reason for the division and then nunez was the and now like nunez is she's is she retired, retired? Yeah. is she done and now there doesn't seem to be that female fighter who's got a lot of focus right now for whatever yeah. reason yeah there's definitely kind of a void of like the unquestionable number one i think uh way lee i think a lot Wei of people Li. are behind yeah. her um and you know, she she shows a lot of promise. Yeah, this obviously, yeah. Sh- Shevchenko is kind of on her spike down. Yeah, now. You I make mean, an argument for for the time being, we don't know. She's still at a point <laughs> where she could bring it back. It does. It definitely does seem that a lot of fighters stay a little too long after they're they've reached that. It's like it's something you said earlier, where you kind of realize that, like, okay, Nunes is better than me. I could probably beat people that are better than me, but I, there's some fighters that you just kind of wonder, like, how how many more times do they want to fight someone because they can't get to that mm-hmm. <clears throat> level? You know, right. I, I don't know. Yeah, um, I think sh- I think Shevchenko. I don't know if you're referring to her when you say that, but like, I don't think she would be at a point where she can't prove something else. Um, I think she could still come and like be the champ. Yeah, you know, she probably could be the bantamweight champ. <laughs> um, yeah, that'd be an uh, option. who's fighting for it? Pennington um, and um, Bueno Silva, Mar- yeah. Myra, Myra. I actually trained with her um, last year. I did. Um, actually, I was at ATT for like a m- on and off for like six weeks, so really like three or four weeks. Um, so I was training with her. She was very nice. She, you know, mostly just grappling, obviously. And then I would see, because I was helping Kayla Harrison, and she was a really big training partner with Kayla, too. So we got to spend a little bit of time together. She's, I'm pretty impressed that she's, like, gotten to, like, in the last year. Like, she's really made a big name for herself. Yeah. yeah. And, like, proven a lot. It was a little bit controversial last time, I guess, with the whole um, Adderall medication yeah. debacle. Um, but yeah, that's crazy. It's like, who would have thought like a year ago that that fight was happening for the Bantamweight mm-hmm. title? So it's, uh, off subject, but interesting, um, with the Adderall thing, uh, USADA leaving the, the UFC. How do you feel about this? Do you- from what, it, from what I understand, it, they're going to be just rolling into another drug testing, testing organization. Yeah, organization. So at first I was like, that can't, like, uh, like there's got to be more to this than what the headline says. Yeah. You know, like so. I, so yeah, it seems like. Uh, well, it, it seems like it's just a big like relationship problem, and it seems like they were Usada didn't want McGregor to fight because he wasn't following the six month protocol. Mm-hmm. The UFC obviously needs McGregor to fight for pay per view dollars, and they were like, "No, we're gonna we'll just go to somebody else." 
Yeah, but I mean, that's the rumor. That's the yeah. conspiracy. I mean, it yeah. makes sense if you yeah. follow the money, probably. Right. But, but yeah. at the same time, it's not like they've made the fight for Connor. Yeah. So it's like, if that was the case, it seems like they would have made that fight and, like, you know, but it doesn't seem... So it's kind of like he should see... She said, but... Um, when you entered the USADA pool, were you ha- like, was it a big change in testing? Like you were tested a lot, or it was, yeah, I was tested a lot. Um, it was hard. It was challenging to like yeah. think about it all the time and try to. Keep you have up to tell them it. where you're at at all times, right? Like the, and and like what they were saying, like the app was not perfect at all. Like the app was needed. Yeah, like it took a lot of time, and then it's like, oh, you know, oh, you go somewhere different, and then it's like, God, oh, it's like a big thing always on hanging over you. Um, and like they did come at, for the most part, I had a good experience with USADA. Um, there were times like fight week, they would show up and it'd be like, what the fuck are you doing here? Like, <laughs> I don't wanna, you know, like I just cut weight. Like I'm, it's like Friday, you know, like I cut weight and I just started like, I don't know, just like some weird times that yeah. was like, I'm kind of busy. Like, you know what I'm doing. Um, is this really the time that needs to happen? But again, for the most part, especially locally, like in Orlando, there was always the same, the same girl would show up and it's like a new, like yeah. we were, you know, getting buddy, buddy kind of, you know, like, right. Uh, uh, Nicolette. Hi. She's mm-hmm. not the shit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, she, no, she was really cool. Um, so it was always like good. Usually like at home it was good. And I was an early riser. So she would come at 6am and I'd be like, I just got up. Awesome. Mm-hmm. So yeah. should I work? But yeah, I could see how it would be annoying for like people who plan on getting up at nine and they get not you know not six a.m. or something. A. Yeah, it's like that's when I was. Do you remember how many anyway. times you were tested? Or it's pretty. Um, it was pretty often. Yeah, it was pretty often. Um, every few months. Yeah. They would show either at the gym or at my house. Um, and then I ended up being a part of like their. Um, they did like a, like a a, a trial program for um remote testing so they so I, I got signed on to be part of this trial where they for it was like once a week they were just like testing this out so like once a week for like six weeks um maybe more than that they would send me like uh they sent me a big kit and then i had a whole box and they would do like a zoom call so it was like when covid started yeah and um so we do like a zoom thing and they would like you'd have to be on camera then and then um like bring bring the camera like bring my laptop to the to the door of the bathroom and like so it's kind of like is this the secure network <laughs> that we're yeah, streaming on yeah. um but but it was pretty cool and then i ended up because i did that that later that year i got like the 20 times shirt because i had been tested 20 times yeah um but it was i legitimately got tested like every couple months yeah yeah so it was interesting <laughs> rich what do you got for me there buddy um you know, uh, just going back to the fighting thing, uh, I asked for techniques you think people should use in fights. And um, is there anything that you did in the gym that you felt like you might have had a chance of pulling off in a fight that may have gotten you a bonus or anything like that? Because I know uh. personally, like I, you know, I never reached any height like you did. <laughs> but there's moves in the gym that we're all like, these are my moves. <laughs> I'm going to win by this. And you don't do it. Is there yeah. anything that that like you had? Like the one thing hanging over my my whole career, as you said, I came up in Taekwondo, and especially like in the beginning, it was like all I did in the gym was tink head kick, tink head kick, tink head kick all the time, and I never got a head kick knockout. And that was the one thing I always was like, that's gonna be like the best moment of my career is like a head kick knockout. And I've gotten like head kicks that land good and stumble, but I never got the head kick knockout. And that was like, I can't say devastating, but it was just, it's kind of like, man, that's one thing I'm, I'm good at head kicks Mm -hmm. (laughs) and I never got that. (laughs) Well, I remember, uh, so your fight with Norma Dumont, that was actually a last minute replacement. Mm -hmm. Um, she was supposed to fight Danielle Wolf, who's a boxer. Yeah. So watching the, the very few footage you could find on Danielle, um, she had the one fight on contender series. She overreacts to kicks always she's like hands down yeah so getting prepared for that fight i know we drilled a ton of head kicks and then we fought norma who's like a sonda champion <laughs> who's like well versed in head kicks so she saw him coming oh. um so yeah it's just one of those things where i think too like i know you caught me in it a lot we called it the canadian necktie but the uh, yeah. peruvian necktie submission yeah she was pretty solid at that in the gym yeah um mm-hmm. but we never never saw it in the fight in the beginning of like in my amateur career i got a lot of arm bars um 
I was so I was like, arm bars are my thing. And Something's then as soon there, as yeah. I went pro, I started getting chokes, and I was like, well, That's you probably different. you have to imagine that if you're a female in that era, and Ronda Rousey's arm barring everyone, you start working your arm bar defense every single day. True. That's a good That's point. Yeah, right you know what I mean. Time, so yeah. like, yeah, you're arm barring everyone. She's arm barring everyone, and all of a sudden, women MMA is going like. No more arm bars. No more arm bars. Yeah. yeah, like you know. True. Yeah, everyone. I'm sure everyone like in the gym. They're like, like yeah. What she did, just like you said, like Monday morning at the gym, at coach is like, let's talk about this arm bar. Right? Yeah. I did to well, everyone. You so, know, yeah. Carl Parisian when he was mm. big, he was throwing everyone. Yeah. And then the the judo throw is nearly impossible now. Everyone learned some pretty basic yeah, counters and like then, that. Yeah, but you, everybody down. has it, that. It's the interesting that there's these certain people that fundamentally change. Mm-hmm. you know mma like khabib even like his ground game yeah you know we would reference that a lot the dagestani training. handcuffs or the, right. yeah. the triangling the legs against right. the cage yeah like that. You, know. you know uh your fight with macy um i bring this up a lot that was one of my, another one of my favorite fights of yours um as an amateur you landed like nine hook kicks to the head i remember after like one or two landed <laughs> I just kept calling for him in the corner. I was like, it's working. Like, I don't know why it's working, but keep doing it. Yeah, I landed a lot. I, I landed a lot of hook kicks in that fight. She's tough. <laughs> She's super tough, yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, we see it now in her yeah. UFC career. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that was uh, that was one where I was like, maybe Felicia's got, like, the best hook kick in the game. Like, we can really right. <laughs> utilize that. Never got a knockout with it, though. So. No, no. That was a decision. It, there's uh, apparently still a possibility if we, one of these companies reaches out with a big dollar amount. So <laughs> we're, we're all there for that. I get, I, I'm get. i assuming I get free tickets if you get a – I'm just saying, you know, like – He's just a <laughs> shill for, like, yeah. uh, like Game Red FC or whatever <laughs> <Right>. it is. <laughs> oh Jorge Masvidal, give me a call, man. What's going on, bro? So uh, you're you're doing commentating uh, when you can. I know uh, the Canadian promotion. Which which promotion yeah, is this? They're called Palace Athena, and it's all it's all women's. So mm. it's it's like Invicta 2.0 kind of thing. They actually bring a lot of uh, overseas talent, so it's not just Canadian. Just like a lot of people from Europe and South America. Where do they film it at? Um, every event so far has been in Calgary. Okay. Yeah. So All right. In Canada. So it's, it's been, they're having their third event, third event in early next year. All right. So I, I, you know, I got invited out the first event to commentate. Um, I was like, definitely. Yes. That's awesome. Like get to go to Canada and like be part of this women's thing. You know, it's kind of cool. Um, and then I actually vibed really good with everyone that's there, like the people, the other commentators. So um, that's like the one promotion that I'm like, oh, I'll, you just, you know, my number, You're like, go ahead, just give yeah. me a call whenever you need me. And cause it's like, I don't want to say it's easy because commentating is like a whole other world. Then you have to be obviously like prepared and well-versed and like the people, but, um, it also really matters like who you're sitting next to. And I feel like there, it was like really easy to just like click with everyone. Yeah. So it was uh, definitely a great experience. Well, we've certainly seen like Laura Senko and other women that came up from the Invicta as well that have now made, and now Megan is doing more commentary as Mm -hmm. well. Um, So is that something you you hope to do more of, or is that something that you're kind of like, what, what comes, what comes? Yeah. Kind of whatever, whatever comes. Like when I stopped, when I retired from fighting, I was like, I'm going to really try to push for this a lot and I just kind of wanted to explore the field a little bit so I did I did some gigs with like Eagle FC and Mm -hmm. Combate and of course Palace Athena and um it is like a whole different world and like part of it I just feel like not that I'm not cut out for it but maybe like my passion for it isn't the same that it or like isn't where it needs to be to be really good at it sure because it's a skill. You know, yeah, it's a skill and like the energy of it. Yeah. And everything that goes into it. It's like I know I like I said, I can be good at anything that I really want, but I feel like how much part do you of want it, that? How much like of that like uh, persona do I really want to like you know, go after? So I feel like maybe it just wasn't like a uh, not that it's not a good fit cuz I really enjoyed it, but I think it's yeah. I think you called back that often. That's I mean that's one of the things that you know Rich and I have been talking about a lot lately because Rich is doing promoting now, but he never really saw himself as a promoter, right? Right. Yeah. And like I've been doing a lot of refereeing, and I never really saw myself yeah. as a referee. Right. You know. Yeah. So there's this weird kind of like, how much do I want to do this? Is this really yeah. what I want to do with my time? Right. And also like I didn't practice a lot before there's like that big moment. You know, it's kind of like. 
I feel like, you know, if, if you really want it and you like, get the opportunity to practice it a lot, um, which I could chase more opportunities. So that's part of where it's like, if I really wanted it, I would be chasing those opportunities. So do I really want it? Yeah, like <laughs> more know? local stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Well, you know, uh, it just reminded me, uh, we did a show. We yeah. commentated one time. The, um, they had us <laughs> sat next to the speakers. <coughs> yeah. Literally. And, and in between rounds and in between fights where commentators really kind of build into the next fight. You, you couldn't. It, we had to too compete loud. with, you know, too loud crew. And you guys so. didn't and you guys didn't have headphones or microphones, right? You had like a little We uh, had microphones, no headphones, um and then the cameras weren't positioned on us at all. Yeah, they were I was just there. in the ring. I was at that fight. Yeah, yeah I remember um, that. And you know, it's unfortunate cuz that was a uh, it's a good promotion as far as like putting on fights and everything, but they're not used to a production. Well, there those are different skills. Mm-hmm. Right? Like And if you're if you're outsourcing hiring someone, you're not really overseeing it. So yeah. you get what you pay and for. And you also don't know mm-hmm. what what is the cost, you know. Yeah. I and mean, we had this conversation the other day where we're like, Well, what is a good you know, what does a good referee get paid? Yeah. We have no idea. You know what I mean? What is what is it like who I have no idea. Yeah. Right. I'm I'm you know, like <sighs> Yeah, right. uh, like you fighting for Invicta, I remember being there going, Well, wow, this is really nice because we had never really been on a show that yeah. was filmed. Were like you the that. Scottish right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Scottish Rite's pretty. Yeah. And then um and then you go to the UFC, which is like a whole nother level. They got the Apex and they yeah. you know know who does promotion and, and you know production better than the UFC. So then you get to work with like Eagle F C which obviously with Khabib, like they had a lot of money behind they had it. A lot. Yeah, it was it was um, a good experience. For and sure. a lot of guys are competing to be on that. You know, like you said, like you're not urging to be on these shows. You're not out there like trying hustling. to hustling. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. And like the people that I was, you know, the other people on commentary, they have like a personality that kind of like is overwhelming sometimes. And it's like, how do you fit? How do I fit yeah. into that? You know that. And then they also like. So that originally I was on like the three person seat, you know, where like the main commentary is. And then like last minute, they're like, you're going to be like the like the Dean Thomas where we're going to cut to you here and there. Yeah. So just be ready with like a quick, <laughs> just, just be ready with like a Dean Thomas level answer for whatever. And it's like, uh, <laughs> you're like, okay. Okay. <laughs> OK, you didn't tell me that before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because I got replaced by Kamara Usman. Oh, well, who's this guy? Yeah. <laughs> well, Unbelievable, <come> bro. <laughs> Right. Or like I um, I was supposed to do like the I don't want to put him in. He's never going to watch. I don't know. So he was like, so <laughs> nobody like, watches like, this no, show. No, don't worry. Like, well, say whatever you certain want. Certain people might, might not see it. But either way. So it was like, oh, prepare like a like a play by play of what you think uh, the game plan should be for this person. And then this other commentator is going to play prepare for this other person. And then you guys are going to do like a like a rundown in the cage, like fight week. And it's going to be like run. Um, for promotion and it's like i'm i show up like fully prepared with like a page of notes that like actually grindle helped me with oh, because i, I yeah, was I like grindle, if it's notes was, grindle loves them i was like yeah exactly i was like um i i watched you know i i did hours and hours you did your homework. too but i was like let me compare notes with you so i i asked him to help and to me. be fair she was on point with most of what i said so you know i was like i was like <laughs> i'll read my notes you read your notes and let's job. see you know thank you yeah. um i learned from the best no um so yeah, so then I show up and I'm like all ready to do this thing, and then it's like, wait, didn't did nothing. It's like he didn't prepare it. Also, it's like it just went in his way, and then it was just I just you know I don't I don't put my foot down hard enough. I gotcha. You know what I mean? So it's like um, I felt like I need that like put my foot down harder personality, Same, yeah. and that's just something that, like I could build that up, but like like you said, or like we were talking about, like am I gonna push for that uh, those opportunities more, or am I just gonna like maybe look at something else yeah i've i i, I get where you're coming from yeah. because i've i've i think with, like with refereeing right now like there's some organizations that i'm refereeing for and there's some organizations where i was like i should probably try to referee for them more but if they're not like if i'm telling them like hey let me ref but i'm not harassing them like they're not getting me to ref you know right. and i'm not necessarily like you have to chasing them down yeah, you know like advocating for yourself is like half of it for a lot of stuff <laughs> um well we're we're right into to like two hours here so nice. wow. that's a that's a long podcast um rich do you have anything else that you wanted to i think we covered most of the the 
questions that we, we were you're the thinking. first guest that we've had together yeah so yeah thank you awesome yeah um <laughs> we really appreciate you coming on the show i think that like you had such an interesting career um because you were uh, in a lot of ways you know like coming up into a field where it's like it didn't exist and then you got this really amazing firsthand run where you fought uh, amazing uh you know these names that um you know rich always says that you are the only or like orlando fighter that's ever fought for a world title and it's true you know like so you should definitely you know <laughs> yeah i mean if it was any other fighter they'd probably boast and brag and it'd be like on their instagram handle yeah and everything. only central florida yeah. fighter to ever fight for title <laughs> which listen there's a lot of really good fighters out of Central Florida. Yeah. So oh, yeah. It's not, I mean, Florida in general, and, you know. and you're one of the few. I mean, you don't see this even in any region. You don't see it often where a fighter goes from one gym, stays with one gym. And goes to the and top. And goes to the top. Yeah. Um, so, you know, kudos to you and kudos to your team. Obviously, I'm part of that. Yeah, he's but, uh, claiming. He's claiming. You. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, it's a big deal because that's a, I, I know the work that you put into it, um, but no one knows it better than you. And, you know, Obviously, a lot of fighters around here look up to you. They, they, they know who you are. You do the Point Muay Thai shows. She's the meanest timekeeper that we've got. So Very mean. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the, uh, you know, the local regional scene, you know, I think holds a lot of, like, we all love Felicia. Accolades, yeah. Yeah, like, in, you know, yeah. I'm sure there's plenty of female fighters out there that want to be in your shoes or as far as your shoes went, they want to reach there as well. So I mean, I... I I, you would be hard pressed to find anyone that's fought for a world title in the last five years that's willing to come to our events and be timekeeper. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> that's, that does say a lot about, um, your, um, how humble you are in the sport, you know? So well, thank you guys. Yeah. Um, I would, I would put, you know, there's, there's a, the BMF and then there's the NMF. Now, uh, that's the nicest motherfucker, right? Yeah, and then okay. now Steven Thompson, I say deservingly, Right, just because of how long he's been as nice as he's he is. very nice, yeah. right? He's very nice. Decades long yeah. career. Yeah. Now for women's, they supposedly gave it to Roxanne Modafari. Right, that's who you also. Uh, I've adore. also worked with. Yeah, yeah you I, adore yeah, Roxanne. I, I, big fan of Roxanne. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of Roxanne. Um, but you know, I've been around I'll Roxy. Fighter for it. I'm fighter <laughs> for I was gonna it. say I've been around Roxy. <laughs> I would say Felicia wins nicer. Felicia's nicer wow. than Roxy, oh. and could Roxy's they, a sweetheart. Could they have a we fight know just to see who's nicer? Yeah, I'm down yeah, to watch that. Yeah, 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 yeah. One of those grappling promotions should totally. Oh, have you done? Let's do have that. you thought about doing any more like like an IBJJF or anything like that? Um, Does I it mean, interest it's you? crossed my mind. Like I did, I did one of the submission underground. Is that what Shell Sun is? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, in like 2020 or something, something yeah. around there. It was during, right in the heat of COVID. Um, I did that. That was pretty fun. Um, training for it was cool. Um, I'm not opposed to it. Yeah. Uh, I feel like I really enjoyed like taking a break from hard training. Yeah. But I do still train and I feel like I How about how about we we shout out one of our um one of our uh, richest partners I should say. Would you ever do a submission grappling series fight? It's a possibility. Possibility? A possibility. If they reached out to you, could they maybe get Felicia Spencer in a submission grappling series? It's it's a possibility. It's on. It's a possibility. <laughs> All right. See, I love Jada. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say no. See, that's the thing. Grindel knows. I have a hard time saying no, right? Interesting. <laughs> First in. But uh, yeah, I mean, I love I love the promotion. So yeah, if the right like thing came along, yeah. Um, Is there someone out there that you'd want to grapple? No, that's the thing. It's like there's not really anyone that like really. It's like maybe Roxanne. No, I'm joking. No. Um, Let's make it happen. I think we can make um, that happen. I, yeah. I I know people. I mean, granted, Roxy's a, a 125, 25, yeah. 15. Yeah. I'm pretty sure right. she's yeah, Catch weight somewhere yeah. in there. So it's like, it's like I have nothing to gain from that. It's yeah. like it's like it's one of those lose lose for me. It's like if I win, do I really win? If I beat her, yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, yeah. I'm sure there's some, there's, there's, I'm sure some, we could maybe get cyborg <laughs> cyborg. Yeah. I mean, that happen. she's a black belt. Right? She's a little PTSD. She's back. <laughs> she's on top of me again. She shows up with like the face paint. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. Uh, oh, no, God, I'm that's funny. No, 
you know, the right thing comes along one day. But you would like be said, affected I'm, I'm though, not, right? Because you, you're technically still under contract with the OC. So right. I, I yeah, am, but I feel I like am. they would let you get away with. I that. would need. I would need permission. Um, I only I got permission for a submission underground because they're on UFC Fight Pass. Mm. Right? Yeah. So there's a chance, but. Um, it doesn't really like scream out to me. Like I said, yeah. I'm enjoying just like showing up at the gym when I want to, having fun, being yeah. silly, not striking. Like the days that I want to like go hard, I'm like, oh, and then I, I'm like, I still got it. Yeah. So. <laughs> but uh, it's kind of nice to just be like, uh, quote unquote, like normal human. And, like, You're a normie now. It's like, oh, it's Tuesday evening. I have some free time. I don't have to go to the gym. Yeah. So it's kind of cool. All right. Well, um, Felicia, thank you so much for being a. a uh, amazing guest on our show and certainly the most famous guest we've ever had on our show best guest so far best guest it's like I'm the only I had Rob from McDojo Life <laughs> well, you're was, setting a high you know, bar yeah, you're setting a very yeah. high bar everyone well, no, else I had, this. I had Rob from McDojo Life yeah. and we have an unrecorded episode of, of Joe Penafell out there somewhere but you also said with me so with as, you as me the, as co-host yeah yeah yeah, yeah, Wait, yeah are you yeah. saying Joe is more famous than me no, no I, I just um, he was a good episode, but we didn't oh, we never sure. published it. So I, technically, I can have I it. only imagine why he's a wild one. Uh, he got a little crazy on <laughs> that. That's right. You, you trained with I Joe. I trained back with Joe. Day, yeah. I, you know, half of half of the people that train at other Orlando gyms have trained at the Jungle before. Yeah, <laughs> I know them all. It's the it's one of the oldest running gyms in in the area. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I, a lot of them I know from here or there. You know, but. Um, is there anyone you want to shout out at the end of this? Uh, you know, now that we're winding yeah. down, is there? Um, you know, if you're if you're on the lookout for a new promotion to watch, like I said, Palace Athena. Um, you can find them on Instagram. They're gonna have a show next year. They actually have put on really good fights. Really? Yeah, the fights that they put on, like I said, they're pulling like really good fighters from Europe and all over the place, and it's a really fun promotion. So I mean, I you, would say you shout them out. I mean, obviously, I'm a little biased because, like, they asked me to come commentate. So you can hear me talk if you want or or mute it and play something else in the background. But well, um, you referred it to as, like, Invicta 2.0 because that's kind of, like, yeah. their mission is they want to really yeah. kind of set they, the standard for women's MMA. And they treat the fighters so good. Yeah. They pay them very well. They have good bonuses. They treat them like superstars when they're at the hotel, at the venue. Like, it really is, like, they're setting the bar high for these girls. So pretty cool what they're doing out there very cool yeah. very and of course cool. everyone you know that well like i used to always say everyone i train with and mm-hmm. <laughs> so i don't have a fight coming up i guess i don't have to say all that yeah, <laughs> yeah. but you could still be seen training at right. the jungle Absolutely. obviously yeah yeah i do I am, i'm there not as often as i um would you know should be but yeah. i'm there <laughs> you, haven't, you haven't punched rich in a long time yeah yeah. Right. The last I was like, I pulled out the gloves for the seminar, and I'm oh like, boy. I think my gloves got crusty and it's just shedding. Oh, She's like, horrible. Are these okay to wear? I'm like, no. You know my pet peeves. It was one like, of those crumbling yeah. gloves. Oh, I'm no. like, I haven't pulled these out. Like they were fine the last time I wore them. I wasn't gonna say, but bag. you just infuriated me yeah. even more. She kept saying "os" during the Muay Thai. Oh, I know. I didn't, I didn't even click Felicia. that. It's like that's a jiu-jitsu word, not uh, the. That's on the Muay list of pet peeves. <laughs> Never. Oh, like, obviously, God. I take a lot more jujitsu classes. Oh, and then. and she broke one of my cardinal rules. What I say sorry. Yeah, she says well, sorry. Never say you're sorry. Never say sorry. That's, we've talked about a whole. We did a yes, whole episode basically I know. on it. I saw it. What? Never say you're sorry. It's a agree terrible to, idea. Agree to disagree. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> As always, we hope to be back in two weeks for our next episode. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> <laughs>